I don't know if the moon had anything to do with it in the beginning. It sure as hell didn't mean much to me. I was happy as a pig just test flying jets. As for rockets, <laughs> they weren't for flying, they were for fireworks. But it all changed pretty damn quick. We got into a race, and putting a man on a rocket became the most important thing in the world. And I figured it ought to be me. That's the test pilot's nature, he wants to be first. The finish line. That's what the moon was. A brand new runway. Fate, luck, the Russians, whatever it was, it put us in the spotlight. And flying the thing was only half the job. The other half was making it look easy. And that's the part no one saw. It was never easy, never safe, never routine. I guarantee you never heard the real story. It was a hell of a ride. Listen, uh, Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. That's me, Slayton, Major Donald K. Deke to my friends. It was 1957, and I thought I had the greatest job in the world, test pilot. Then out of the blue, I got selected for some crazy experiment called Project Mercury. For me and six other pilots, it turned into the trip of a lifetime. Before it ended, one of us even walked on the moon. Some of it made the headlines, but to me, the best part never got told. I was in the middle of it all from the very beginning to the end. Now I can finally tell it the way I saw it. I remember it as clear as yesterday. It's been a lot of years and a lot of miles since I met these guys, my friends and comrades. Al Shepard, John Glenn, Gordo Cooper, Scotty Carpenter. We started out with one thing in common, all we ever wanted to do was fly. Just a farm boy from Wisconsin, but I'd had flying on the brain since I was a kid. After the war, I found a way to keep going faster and higher. Test flying. Sure, it got a little hairy sometimes. Dealing with unknowns, things always go wrong. get into trouble but the best can get out see a test pilot with a problem doesn't think I've got 10 seconds until I crash he thinks hell I got 10 seconds I bet I can save this thing well maybe you can't but you think you're the best even if you die trying to prove it faster farther higher that's test flying. Then overnight the game changed. Faster, farther, higher no longer meant wings and wheels. It meant rockets. Now there was a chance to fly into space and into history. We all wanted it. But out of hundreds of test pilots, it came down to seven astronauts. And there was a lot more to being an astronaut than we realized, like press conferences. With so many to choose from, I figured these seven would be the best damn test pilots in the country. It's my pleasure to introduce to you. And I, can I looked around and I couldn't believe my eyes. I thought, either I don't belong here or some of these other guys don't. Malcolm S. Carpenter. Scotty was kind of a philosophical type, a bit of a poet. Not exactly the typical test pilot. Leroy G. Cooper. Gordo matched the basics, but I'd heard he was a real hot dog. Had a tendency to be a little flaky. John H. Glenn. John had gotten a lot of press for setting a cross-country speed record, but he was over age and he really didn't meet the education requirement. Virgil I. Grissom. 
Gus Grissom. Now here was a real test pilot. He'd flown in Korea and he was a damn good engineer. A little short, though. Walter M. Shira. Wally was a real joker, and nobody enjoyed Wally's sense of humor more than Wally. But he was Navy, and I respect anyone who flies off carriers. Alan B. Shepard. Over the years, this guy, Shepard, would end up being my best friend. But then he was competition. I could tell he'd be the guy to beat. Donald K. Slayton. And, of course, me. The best of the seven. Wouldn't be a good test pilot if I wasn't sure of that. These ladies and gentlemen are the nation's Mercury astronauts. I was happy I'd made it and ready to work. But why all the publicity? We hadn't done anything yet. And the questions had nothing to do with flying. Why is it that family men were picked instead of bachelors? Don, as a bachelor, answer that, please. <laughs> Uh, Walt, the only thing I can say is that the, uh, the medical statistics prove that married men live longer than bachelors. And they... <laughs> Here we were, military men, and they're asking us to get warm and personal. Uh, let's, the question is, what is the motivation of these men? Oh, man, I wanted to be anywhere but there. Okay, my full name is Donald K. Slayton, and my hometown is Sparta, Wisconsin. And, uh, age I was nervous as hell and a long way from smooth, and, uh, but the, the guy next to me laid it right out. I have no problems at home. My family's in complete agreement. <laughs> <laughs> well, there it was. Nobody was going to stop Al Shepard. But John Glenn understood that moment better than any of us. These people were looking for heroes. And John gave them just what they wanted. I think we are very fortunate that we have should we say, been blessed with the talents that have been picked for something like this. And I think we'd be almost remiss in our duty if we didn't make full use of our talents. It was like he'd been cast for the role. John understood what the rest of us missed. America was in a Cold War. We seven were carrying the flag in a race with the Russians, a race that started with Sputnik. Sputnik, the first man-made object in orbit. If the Russians could put a satellite over our cities, then a bomb might be next. Their own people at 9.40, I believe it was, it passed over Detroit, and at one minute later it passed over Washington. This is what 18,000 miles an hour is. They do not tell the sober ramifications of what Russia has done for herself as a world power. They've been operating since World War II under the illusion that this was basically a peacetime situation. This isn't peacetime. This is all out war. People were scared. If Russia could do it, why not us? What about an American rocket? As of now, the United States is strong. Our scientists assure me that we are well ahead of the Soviets, both in quantity and in quality. President Eisenhower was on the hot seat. I asked you, sir, uh, what are we going to do about it? His answer was NASA, a program for manned space flight. That's where we came in. NASA needed pilots. The first word of mouth on Project Mercury made it sound pretty dumb. I can recall my own reaction when a bunch of idiots. Yeah, right in this one. big auditorium at the Pentagon with about 70 guys, two engineers and a shrink trying to tell us about how exciting it would be to get in a capsule on top of a rocket. And I said, where the hell's the no desk? Then they make us feel better. They said, well, uh, don't worry, we're going to send a chimpanzee first. Where the hell is the no desk? <laughs> but the more we heard about it, the better it sounded. Manned space flight. It just might work. And if it did, every one of us wanted that first ride, especially the guy sitting right next to me. Alan B. Shepard, son of a career military officer, Naval Academy graduate, test pilot, and husband of Louise. In the early days, all I knew about Al Shepard was that he was a hot jock in a test plane, on the fast track to Admiral Stripes, and not a guy to stand in front of unless you're looking to get run over. In fact, I'm glad I wasn't around that Friday when Al read the New York Times about Project Mercury and thought he'd been passed over. Why am I not on the list of guys who have received telegrams? 
And I thought, certainly they could not have overlooked me, one of the great test pilots of the Navy. So I was in a terrible mood at the end of the day. Uh, drove home, spent the weekend at Virginia Beach. My poor wife suffered the children and the dogs and everybody felt the wrath of Shepard to some degree. I was still totally out of it when I went back uh, to the office on Monday morning. And I was in the process of reading the New York Times again when a yeoman came in the office, said, uh, Commander, uh, this is a dispatch which came in Friday, and for some reason we didn't get it to you. Well, I looked at it, and I practically kissed the guy because here was the invitation to go back to Washington to try out to become an astronaut. But it was only an invitation to try out. Hundreds of pilots got them. Before anyone got selected, they had to go through testing the likes of which we'd never seen before. Hey, which, which test uh, they like, please? And it's, it's rather difficult to pick one because if, uh, if you figure how many openings there are on the human body and how far you can go in any one of them... And... <laughs> you gave it away. <laughs> Now, you, an you answer which one would be the toughest for you. test that I ever experienced was the time when this uh, wasn't even a doctor he was just a, a corpsman of some sort put this needle in my in my hand here this meaty part of my hand and then put electricity into it which balled up my hand and hurt like you know, like you know, the devil and then he was taking pictures on an oscilloscope up there which the thing failed somehow if they could smoke and everything like that and so when my hand was balled up he called up and wanted to get a TV technician to go fix the thing I see you brought your uh, Air Force pressure suit with you. Yes. It doesn't look awfully comfortable. It isn't. Sergeant Cusey, will you stand up and move around? When they got done with our bodies, they started on our minds. That is respecting Joe's mobility to some extent. Uh, Dr. Garofal, uh, I believe that Dr. Struvehole referred to you as a psychologist. That's right. Now, isn't it rather surprising that a psychologist should be investigating uh, a physical condition like weightlessness? Every time, every one of us that went in to see the psychiatrist, when we had those Rorschach tests, you know, the, and we were looking at uh, nothing but a blank piece of paper, and she gave me a a sheet of white paper and she said well what does that look like and I said oh that's easy and he says I want you to just look at this card and you visualize the story and and then tell me what it is you see and I said that's a, a a blonde woman dressed in a white leotard on a white horse riding through desperately through a snowstorm she said, it's not really his where do you see that we always saw feminine attributes in there feminine anatomy anatomy in there only to show how masculine we were and the psychiatrist thought we were all sex maniacs but he passed us so i took all of the thing and then i turned it over and i said you gave it to me upside down and that did it i it was over it right there <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe subconsciously I was trying to not get in the program. But <laughs> we were well patients being looked at by sick doctors. Hundreds were tested. Only seven made it. But competing for the title astronaut was nothing compared to what was about to begin. The competition for the first ride and the title, First Man in Space.
These guys look pretty tame now, sitting around chewing over old times. But I knew them back when being number one was all they lived for. They were, they were very competitive among each other because they each wanted to get their ride. And there was only so many people who could ride a Mercury spacecraft. We worked as a team. But to get that first flight, we each had to prove we were tougher, smarter, and better prepared than the other six. All of a sudden, now here you've got seven guys trying to fly the same airplane. And boy, uh, there was competition. And I think everyone sensed it uh, in almost everything we did. I remember one of the first meetings we ever had with Bob Gilruth, who ran the program at that time. He said we had enough doubts about the program. We could go back to our services where we had come from and, and no questions asked, and that was it. All we had to do was say the word. And, uh, of course, nobody ever did. We were fighting to get positions, not to go back someplace. It was just a matter of personal pride to know that you were the best and that you were going to make the first flight. There is rivalry, of course, but uh, the Navy people were the best. There's no doubt about that. And the fact that we had three Air Force people with us was purely political and one token Marine uh, which, that's all right, the Marines are part of the Navy anyway. In this group, if you had a weakness, you never, never let it show. I was doing great until Carpenter got a bright idea. And as I recall, it was at my suggestion that we took scuba training at Little Creek with the UDT fellow, tough program, and they put us through some real paces was sort of cavorting around this nine-foot deep pool. All of a sudden, we look, and his slate down the bottom. The guy couldn't swim. Gus and I dive down and bring Deke up to the surface. They, they admitted Slate was probably the best scuba diver of all, because he'd go to the bottom right away. <laughs> his wife, Marge, uh, remarked that uh, he had been home practicing in the kitchen sink, trying to inhale from his mouth and exhale through his nose in the water. But he did that whole training and didn't tell anybody that he didn't know how to swim. Sure, it's funny now, but the pressure to perform was nonstop. We needed to let off a little steam. We weren't going to let the fact that we were astronauts keep us from having fun. But some of us had different definitions of fun. I think while the other astronauts sometimes were a little bit more mischievous and things they did, and John stood out as the all-American boy in that particular group. John Glenn didn't appreciate our kind of fun. One night he made that very clear. Well, you know, frankly, uh, when we were discussing extracurricular activities, if you will, I thought to myself, well, gosh, why is this even coming up? Why is it being discussed? Uh, doesn't everyone have the right to do what they want to do? John said, uh, knock it off, kind of. You guys are having too much fun. John came down on us much like a mother hen, so we didn't like that too much. I was afraid at that time that if uh, there was any very severe publicity about the group, negative publicity, that it could affect the kind of, of, uh, of support funding out of the Congress. It could, uh, it could really harm us somewhat, so I was a little bit concerned about it. Extracurricular activities was a tempest in the teapot compared to the issue of who would fly first. When we finally heard, it was typical fighter pilots in a room, each convinced he's the best. But six of us got some very bad news. We are asked by Bob Gilruth to stay on a little later than we normally would have. Uh, we sat there in our magnificent office, seven steel desks in one room, and waited and waited. And there wasn't a heck of a lot of conversation. No introductions, no pleasantries. He said, well, we've been watching you guys now for almost a couple of years. And Bob didn't miss words. He said, uh, Glenn, Grissom, and Shepard are selected for the first Redstone flight. It turned out to be Al, and Gus was to get the second flight, and John was to be back up for both. It was an, emotion, an emotional high because 
of those seven equally qualified guys, I had been picked to make the first flight. I, I can recall really feeling deflated, because this is one of those rare times when you didn't make the mark, at least I hadn't. And here were Slayton, Carpenter, Cooper, and myself, second team. A very, very traumatic feeling. Not being first was bad enough, but not even placing in the first three. I couldn't believe it. Because they all came forward and shook my hand and congratulated me, uh, some with less enthusiasm than others. It was time to put everything else aside and do the job. Al and his backup, John, got to work preparing for the flight. Al was ready to take his seat in the cockpit and his place in history. Unfortunately, the seat in the cockpit was temporarily occupied. I guess we, uh, this uh, chimpanzee who was flying in space uh, took off at 10.08. He reports that everything is perfect and working well. <laughs> At one point, there were something like 20 or 30 animal flights. So many that uh, Bob Gilruth, the center director, suggested once we should move the program to the French Cameroons, where all the chimps live, and just launch there. Go out and pull one out of a tree and stick him in a capsule. We found all the jokes real funny. Time to feed the chimp. Spam in a can. Shepard, Grissom, and Glenn, the link between monkey and man. But we hadn't signed on to fly standby while Bonzo pushed the outside of the envelope. At one time, uh, this uh, uh, Al, he gave me a bunch of static, you know, and I kind of mentioned to him, I said, you know, Al, if you don't like it, we can go back to somebody who works for banana peels. And uh, he kind of threw an ashtray at me at that time. <laughs> Chimps don't talk back, test pilots do. We knew until we were flying, the program and our lives would be out of our control. We'd seen enough monkey business and we were ready to go. Then the last chimp flight before Al had a problem. And Werner von Braun, our German rocket genius, wanted one more test. The escape tower fired, but it stayed hooked on to the to the capsule. So the monkey got a lot, a lot higher and a lot further than he should have gone. And we said, well, heck, we know what happened. They figured out which switch it was. We said, we're ready to go. You remember all that discussion? They said, let's go. But the extra test delayed the schedule. The first man in space wouldn't be named Al or Gus or John or even Deke. It would be Yuri, Yuri Gagarin, a Russian cosmonaut. I'll never forget the, Al's reaction. He, he said, look at that goddamn thing, and he, he hit his hand so hard I thought he was going to break it. The public didn't like losing to a Russian any more than Al did. It means they're getting ahead of us, and we certainly need to start working hard to catch up. I think it's about time the America woke up and did something about it. The Russians were beating us. NASA was dragging its heels. We were starting to look bad. And uh, may I ask what that's called? Is that the crash helmet? Oh, I hope not. Uh, after you leave the moon, sir, when you come back to Earth, where will you be landing? I am going to be landing in Nevada. Mm -hmm. In the state of Nevada? In the state of Nevada, yes. Then you're convinced that they will get you back to Earth? I am convinced that they will get me back to Earth. Just how far into it? <laughs> that's what I'm not convinced about. <laughs> Surely they've provided something to break your fall. Oh, yes, the estate of Nevada. <laughs> but Al Shepard was no reluctant astronaut. He couldn't wait to be the first American in space. It takes a whole lot of people to build a new flying machine. But when it's finally ready, only one climbs into the cockpit. Now the world can only watch. America was taking its first step toward the moon. Alan B. Shepard was about to ride the rocket. Early in the morning of 
on Alan's flight, I went in to the crew quarters uh, and awakened him. And he's calm, cool, and collected. Yeah, I was scared to death. In contradistinction to Alan, I was probably uh, the most frightened person on the path because this was a friend of mine, a close, near and dear friend of mine, who was putting his life on the line. I was aware only of the people around me. The medics were going to pat me on the head and finally let us go fly. On the surface, it wasn't going to be much of a flight. A suborbital, we called it. Just 15 minutes from launch till splashdown. And it was 15 minutes of pure unknowns. The launch, the G-forces, re-entry. Any one of them could kill Al. He may have been cool, but the rest of us were more than a little nervous. I have seen people throw up on the launch consoles in the, uh, in the blockhouse because no one wanted to be responsible for a hold or responsible for any kind of a mess up. When the Russians flew Gagarin, they kept it a secret until he was back safe. But Al Shepard was going to make it or break it on live TV in front of millions. The 33-ton rocket is poised to hurl America's first man into space at 5,000 miles per hour. Alan Shepard will rocket to 115 miles above the Earth. He will weigh nearly a thousand pounds from the punishing acceleration of his giant booster rocket. And you know the old desire of all pilots that when you walk up to the airplane, you always kick the tires just to be sure they're not flat. This particular uh, rocket I was never going to see again. So I just stopped as I approached it, looked up into the glare of the spotlights, and, and took a look at the rocket. Uh, sort of uh, another way of kicking the tires, so to speak. Well, all of a sudden you realize, hey, wait a minute. The next one that we launch, it better not get blown up because uh, there's somebody in you know. It's not just um, some monkeys, you know, uh, chimps, but it's the man. People have always said, how does it feel to be in a history book? And I said, listen, when you're sitting on the top of some six million pounds of high explosive, <laughs> you will, the last thing in your mind is being a page in a history book. The countdown dragged on and on. Waiting wasn't easy for any of us, but it was worse for the man locked in the can. Okay. I can't hear you on this goddamn. Can you this phone? Hey, watch your language. We're being recorded every place. We are standing by to resume the count. Reporters, photographers, and technicians here are more excited than ten The rocket is poised and ready. Shepard is ready. The missile range and recovery forces are ready. The 83-foot-tall Mercury Redstone rocket with astronaut Alan Shepard aboard. He's been there several hours now. Up on top of the... Al was beginning to wish he hadn't had that second cup of coffee. I soon discovered that the bladder was uh, getting relatively full, and, and I said, well, why don't you ask Werner if uh, I can open the door and get out and, uh, and go to the bathroom, like a normal person would. And I expected a normal answer. Werner says, no, the astronaut would stay in the nose cone. There would be no door opening. So I told the folks that, uh, that I was going to relieve myself on the spot and uh, they said oh you can't do that you short circuit everything well i said well how about turning the power off so they deliberated a few more minutes and finally turned off the power i relieved myself and uh it uh, started to dry out so i said okay i think you guys can turn the power back on and we'll take the risk of a shock <laughs> I finally said, well, I'm getting tired of this. Why don't you tell them to light this damn candle? I'm ready to go.
Now he was on his own. After years of getting ready, there was nothing we could do but wait. Unraced and it looks good. This is it. He's on the way down. At about this time. You should hear the newsmen here right now. They are absolutely screaming and shouting. They've been jumping up and down, holding their hands over the head with a great sign of victory because this flight is just about at its end. It is a tremendously successful thing. They're kissing each other and hugging and jumping up and down. I can take it. any second. Astronaut ship will be walking on the deck of the aircraft carrier. And we will have completed a most historic event in the history of man's conquest of new frontiers. Then as we're flying toward the carrier, and the entire deck of the carrier was covered with sailors. And the deck was just covered with these guys. Uh, the fact that the carrier had been my home, part of my life. The sailors had been part of my life. And here were these guys, the first guys to welcome me back. This was the first sense in which I had of how people felt about what I had done. That had to have been the most emotional carrier landing which I ever made. This is the beginning of a fantastic new age when two nations are marching into space in a competition with one another. America has finally forged back tremendously in this particular shot. Gus and I met Al after the flight. It felt good. I wanted that first ride myself. Hell, <laughs> each of us did. And we knew the Russians were still way ahead. But Al was one of our own, and he'd put us in the game. We were there because that was what we were trained to do. We were test pilots. But we'd become more than test pilots. Now we were astronauts. When test pilots risk their lives, it's a nine to five job and hardly anybody notices. But the Mercury astronauts had an audience of millions. We all knew getting that first flight would make Al a big man, but we had no idea how big. We voicing for this parade and we're down there and I remember we were all sort of wide-eyed about just like the excitement of the crowd and everybody when we were in the parade just sort of washed over you. The crowd behind us has just now caught a glimpse of Alan Shepard, and you can hear what they're doing about it. I understand Mr. Shepard is a retiring man, doesn't like to make public appearances, doesn't mind being lofted into space, but doesn't like to make public appearances. Here at the White House Rose Garden, the entire staff of the White House has come out to get a look at this first space-born astronaut of the United States. I thought that last Friday was a thrilling day. Today even surpasses last Friday. And as a matter of fact, I got far less sleep last night than I did the night before the flight. <laughs> Thank you very much. As Kennedy made his little speech, as he got ready to present me with the NASA Distinguished Service Medal, it slipped off the box onto the deck, onto the floor. Jack Kennedy came up with the medal first, and he said, Shepard, he says, I present you this medal, which comes to you from the ground up, <laughs> which was a great line.
Kennedy insisted prior to the parade that we return to the Oval Office for a meeting. He said, this is fantastic. Uh, what you've done is, is absolutely fantastic. What do you guys have planned for the future? And then he said, I want a briefing on this. And it was just three weeks after my 16-minute space flight when he announced, folks, we're going to go to the moon and we're going to do it before the end of the decade. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. No single... When I remember hearing uh, the speech and thinking to myself, my God, we have hardly begun to, uh, to walk here and this going to the moon is a, a tremendous step. Everybody in the community thought he was nuts. He said that 20 days after Al Shepard flew in May and we hadn't even put anybody in orbit yet. ...daring flight. But in a very real sense, it will not be one man going to the moon. We make this judgment affirmatively. It will be an entire nation. For all of us must work to put him there. Al's flight made a believer out of Kennedy. And that speech gave the whole country moon fever. All over America, people went to work on the moon shot. I don't know if anybody was a clock puncher. No matter what role they played, that was in the back of their mind. We've got that man to get to the moon. We practically had a big sign chiseled in the sky up there that said, waste anything but time. It was a matter of five to 20 insurmountable problems a day. We were literally writing the book as we went along. Working around the clock was our only hope. Feeling good about Al's flight didn't change the facts. It had taken us three years to get into space for all of 16 minutes. Now we had less than a decade to get to the moon. There was a lot of hard work going on in those days. But that wasn't all that was going on. Oh, and I remember another classic episode where we water skied in the surf, being pulled by a tow to Corvette. a Chevy, a Car Corvette, Corvette, right. Over the years, the military had assigned us to some of the most godforsaken spots on Earth. And at first, Cocoa Beach was no different. But once Kennedy pointed us at the moon, Cocoa Beach, Florida became Spaceport USA. We thought we'd died and gone to heaven. Cocoa Beach was a wild place. It was a wide open, raucous, frontier type existence. It was Boomtown. Uh, lots of pretty girls and lots of heroic men and abandoned. It was uh, like having magic goofus dust placed on your shoulder when they hung that title astronaut on you. There were women on the beach. They were there to have the attention of an astronaut. They wanted to befriend another astronaut, another astronaut. <laughs> and, you know, I used to say, well, they've got astronaut poisoning. There were ladies in Cocoa Beach, Florida, and probably other places around the country who liked to brag about how many or which different astronauts they had managed to slip into their bed. If they only knew that it wasn't all that difficult, <laughs> then they probably wouldn't have bragged that much. <laughs> it was just unbelievable. And no one ever said a word. No one had never gotten depressed, and no one ever said a word. No matter how hard we partied, we couldn't keep the damn moon off our minds for long. All you had to do was step outside and take a look. There it was, waiting. We had to keep moving. Now we had two priorities. Prove that Al's success wasn't just dumb luck and get every Mercury pilot some space flight experience. Gus Grissom had won the second ride. We still didn't have a rocket with enough power to get into orbit, so Gus would make another suborbital flight just like Al's. 
Al's flight was perfect. Gus was out to do even better. Just because Al survived his flight didn't mean the next one would be a ride in the park. Gus knew the risks as well as anyone. For some reason, somebody decided they wanted to put a parachute in the cabin, so I was talking to Gus about it. I said, okay, we'll get it put in. I said, but I don't think it'll do you any good. I don't think you can get it on. And his, his retort was, well, it'll give me something to do until I hit. Sequence start. The engines are on. Four, three, two, one, zero. Gus flew a perfect flight, but after he splashed down, the hatch blew. The capsule filled with water and sank to the bottom. He almost drowned. I was just laying there minding my own business and then pow! The hatch went, I looked up and I saw nothing but blue sky and water starting to come in over the sill. So I tossed my helmet off. My first thought was, get out. And the capsule actually sank and went below the water. And he was having difficulty at getting the capsule out of the water. He couldn't lift it. He ran into an engine problem. And uh, so I was getting water in the suit and uh, getting lower and lower in the water all the time. I was having a fight uh, quite hard to stay afloat. Instead of a Washington parade, Gus got a lot of questions he didn't like having to answer. Captain Britton, did you feel you were in danger in the water or any kind of flight? Well, I was scared a good portion of the time. I guess this is a pretty good indication. You were what? Scared. <laughs> okay. There it was. He said it out loud. He was scared. Of all the feelings astronauts weren't supposed to show, fear was number one. We knew he didn't blow the hatch, but there was no stopping the rumors now. But Gus's flight wasn't all we had to worry about. We hadn't even orbited yet, and the Russians sent up their second orbital flight. Newspaper headlines tell the story. Hermann Titov of Russia returns to Earth after orbiting the globe 17 times in a little more than 25 hours, covering 435,000 miles, which is more than twice the distance from the Earth to the moon. An orbit by a U.S. astronaut is planned later this year. Later this year, the same old story. Russians in the lead and we're dragging. It was getting to be a habit with us. The embarrassing truth was, we weren't going anywhere near Earth orbit this year or any year. Not until we had a new booster. The Redstone we were flying was reliable as hell, but it didn't have enough power. There was no way around it. To reach the moon meant reaching orbit. The only thing we had to do that was Atlas. And Atlas was one bad news booster. This was the only rocket we had to get into orbit. And this was the man who was going to ride it. And so one day I ran into this thing, I think it was in Reader's Digest, and I came in and put it up on the blackboard in the room that we all shared. And it was the definition of a sports car, an emotional hedge against the male menopause. <laughs> There's a brand new bunch of astronauts, and we're going to go down. This is supposed to be a big confidence builder to let us see a big booster take off. So we go down and it's a beautiful, clear, starry night. And so this thing lights off and the, the uh, hold down bars pull back and, and uh, the thing starts up and so theatrical anyway, just the nature of it looks like it was staged by Hollywood or by Disney or somebody, you know, with the searchlights and it's, it's uh, quite impressive. And uh, it we're watching the thing go, and up it goes, and we're watching it hit a high cue, hit the high cue point up there, and instead of going on through it like it was supposed to, it blew. And it looked like an, it looked like an atomic bomb went off right over us. So we all look at each other, you know, and that's the thing we're supposed to ride, you know? So we had a few discussions with the engineers after that. 
So they went back, and in, in fact, Deke was, uh, Deke was uh, the one who followed, in particular, the booster uh, problems that we were having. Problems like that, I didn't have to follow too close. I could see them from the next state. But we were in a race, and the other side was winning. Underneath our astronaut exteriors, we were still fighter pilots. NASA could worry about the Atlas till the cows come home. To us, the situation was pretty damn simple. There was a mission to be flown. It was dangerous. If John didn't make it, there'd be six of us left. And don't kid yourself. As soon as the funeral was over, we'd be lining up to take the next ride. That's the test business. The capsule will be hurtled into the heavens by a mighty Atlas rocket. A failure in any one of the thousands of parts of the rocket could mean death for the red-headed test pilot who volunteered for space flight because of the challenge. John Glenn was about to ride the Atlas, a rocket that had a nasty habit of blowing up. But we had an appointment with the moon. Good Lord, ride all the way. You've got speed, John Glenn. All engines are running. We have lift off. We have lift off. The Atlas missile has lifted off with a pad that is rising steady into the sky. And John Glenn Jr. has begun his first orbital ride around the Earth. Roger, zero G, and I feel fine. Capsule is turning around. Oh, that view is tremendous. They were so concerned that you not be distracted by other things that uh, the original plan was that I would not even take a camera along. I, I thought this was getting to be a little ridiculous, and I said, look, I'm going up on this thing, and, and this, this is going to be a new view of things, and I think we at least ought to have a camera on this. The first orbit was beautiful. Then John started going on and on about something outside his window. And we started wondering if there was a screw loose up in the spacecraft. Uh, this is Friendship 7. Uh, I am in a, a big mass of some very small particles uh, that are brilliantly lit up like they're luminescent. George Ruff, who was the psychiatrist that uh, followed us around in those early days, and George sat in the back of the room, and I was describing these very seriously and, and talking about them, and George cocked his head and said, and what did they say, John? <laughs> Fifteen minutes later, we all stopped laughing. Go ahead, Jim. Roger, you do have a valid impact bag signal up at this time. A valid what? The light in mission control said John's heat shield was loose. At 17,000 miles an hour, when he re-entered, the friction would heat the capsule to 3,000 degrees. Without that shield, he was a dead man. Yeah, we want to be damn sure. We've been talking about it on the ground for a long time. You didn't know anything was going on up there. And I was Capcom. Yeah. And it was my job to tell you what we were, <laughs> <laughs> that your heat shield was loose and might fall off. You remember that one? I remember very well. They, they sort of, you sort of talked around it a little bit about <laughs> what is your indication of this switch and you have this warning light. And, and I, I knew from the questions there was only one thing that could be indicated. And then fine decision was made to leave it on and, and uh, make the reentry with the retro pack. Uh, this is Friendship 7. Uh, what is the reason for this? Do you have any reason? Over. Not at this time. All we could do was tell him not to jettison his retro pack. There was a chance it might keep the heat shield on and keep John alive. Uh, go ahead, Cape. Uh, you're, you're going out. John was hitting the atmosphere. Now the heat began. If he was going to burn alive, it would happen in the next five minutes. He wouldn't know till it was over. The same friction that might kill him also blocked all radio signals. We could only wait and hope and keep listening. Uh, this is Cape. Transmitting blind. Keep talking, Al. Uh, Friendship 7, this is Cape. Do you read? Uh, 7, this is Cape. Do you read, over? Friendship 7, this is Cape. Do you read, over? Green, 
When we finally heard his voice, he sounded like a kid on Christmas morning. Oh, those two emergency and the shoot looks very good. If John had died, the whole program might have died with him. But he didn't. And now he was a made man. The Navy sent a chopper to pick him up, but he didn't really need it. At that point, John Glenn could have walked on water. The man who conquered outer space makes a new conquest as he takes New York by storm. Al's reception had been big, but this was unbelievable. John's flight moved people. It was almost scary. This PR thing had grown into something a lot bigger than any of us, or NASA, or even the politicians had bargained for. The president stays on the sidelines, as Mrs. Kennedy and high-flying Glenn practically go into orbit aboard water skis. Old John was always sharp about stuff the rest of us barely thought of. Now he set his sights on a whole new orbit. 1962, three years since I'd joined the program. I'd been poked and prodded by doctors, paraded around for the press and politicians. I'd mastered every simulator, passed every test. Deke Slayton's time had finally come. The next flight was mine. Is that your capsule sitting back there? Oh, yes, it is. How do you feel about it being out in the elements here this afternoon? Oh, I don't mind it being in the elements if somebody was working on it. You're raring to go. Yes, sir. You're damn right I was raring to go. John Glenn had taken us into orbit, and just surviving it was so remarkable it made him a legend. Now I was going to do it again and prove that the remarkable could become routine. And if I say so myself, I was the best pilot for the job. He just was a, was a pilot's pilot. He just loved to fly. He'd rather do fly. If he couldn't fly, he'd die. And then the worst thing I could ever imagine happened. I was grounded. This is a diagnosis of paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. The only decision that has been made is that Deke will not take the next mission in the MA-7. An irregular heartbeat. I'd had it for years and nobody blinked. Now, just months before my flight, NASA got nervous. If anything went wrong, they didn't want to look bad. I was grounded. They can't do this to me. I mean, he kept saying that over and over again. They can't do this to me. This isn't fair. He was very, very, very upset and very angry and very hurt because this was career was so meant so much to him. To be an astronaut meant so much to him. I tried everything, quit smoking, quit coffee, started jogging my ass off. The whole deal stunk, but I figured it was temporary. I'd get the next flight. But for Wally Shira, things were looking up. He was my backup, he thought. I was off on a trip somewhere. I remember I flew back into Langley in one of our planes, probably a 102, and landed and came by Scott Carpenter and Reen Carpenter's quarters, and my wife was there and the rest of the gang, and. As I drove up my little flashy yellow Healy, Scott came out before I even got to join the group and said, uh, Wally, uh, we've got a problem. Deke's grounded. Immediately I thought, oh, God, it's my flight. And Scott looked at me and said, no, it's not your flight, as if he read my mind. He said, it's my flight, and uh, you'll be my backup. Thud. Another shot in the rear end. I was disappointed for Deke, but uh, that is in the conventional medical wisdom of the time, that was the decision that NASA made. They gave it to me because I had been so busy uh, with John's flight that they figured I was in better shape to do it. So instead of Wally Shira, precision test pilot, we ended up with someone completely different. Scott is a unique person. Uh, he's different. They're only different from the other astronauts, but different from all the other people in the world. NASA saw the job as pure flight test. Evaluate the spacecraft and come home, nothing more. Scotty marched to a different drummer. I was more interested in, in learning about what was there 
than I was in uh, learning about what got us there. Uh, the engineering test pilot flies just to evaluate his machine. That has to be done. But my drummer told me that this is a marvelous opportunity to look at the space Five, environment. Four, three, two, one, zero. I feel the liftoff. The clock has started. From the moment he lifted off, Scott wanted to report the feeling, the human experience of being in space. Scott was like Mr. Wizard up there. He wanted to understand the unknowns of space, like John Glenn's Firefly. It's hard to realize this now. There were so many unknowns in the early days. And this is a fact of the matter. We were really not sure after John flew whether or not there were critters, living critters, out there somewhere. I have the fireflies almost like a light snowflake uh, particle. Scott figured out the fireflies were really wastewater from the capsule. Astronaut pee pee. Those fireflies weren't fireflies. <laughs> no, they weren't. <laughs> they weren't fireflies. It was the constellation Uriah. <laughs> well, that mystery was solved. But Scotty's experiments wasted fuel and took his mind off flying. A test pilot who gets distracted can wind up dead. In mission control, Chris Kraft was ready to blow a fuse. He was in a mess with trying to determine what the hell the fireflies were that Glenn had seen. He wasn't in the right attitude in the spacecraft, and he was had not gone through the checklist required to get ready for retrofiring. I think I'm going to have to go to fly-by-wire and use the window and the scope. Scott was three seconds late firing his retro rockets. At the speed he was going, three seconds late meant he'd land hundreds of miles off course. But even worse, he was out of fuel. There was that. Saving piece coming on. Almost looked like it came off the tower. Oh, I hope not. No fuel. No way to steer. If the angle of re-entry was off, he'd burn alive. I do remember thinking, maybe I won't make it, and this is really tight, but thinking to myself, I ought to be worried about this, but I really am not, and I thought at that time, I'm, I feel almost like I'm somewhere else looking at this situation, interested, but not involved. And I thought, isn't that handy? <laughs> this is Mercury Control. We are still attempting to re-establish contact with the Aurora 7 spacecraft. For 40 minutes, the world waited to hear if Scott was dead or alive. Our data at this time indicates that it is distinctly possible that the Aurora 7 spacecraft may land considerably longer downrange than it was planned. The ship started coming in, and uh, there he is, blithely outside. <laughs> I can't believe it. <laughs> And perfect under control. What's wrong? I'm here. <laughs> and that was Scott. I understand the report came from Hawaii that it was a tired and confused astronaut. <laughs> if my opinion is worth anything to you, this is not true. I will admit to being preoccupied. It was uncanny luck that he survived. And he's goddamn lucky that it didn't come down bass backwards because it could have. Somebody was looking out for him. I didn't uh, realize that people thought I was lucky to make it through. I really did, never felt that it had been that tight. But that's the sort of thing you, you have to face whenever you do new things, things that have never been done before. There are a lot of different uh, uh, masters to serve. I was... Uh, listening to uh, another drummer where my interest in uh, science was concerned in the flight. You know, 
Scotty probably got more out of that one flight than all the rest of us put together. But NASA wasn't paying us to be human. They wanted astronauts to keep their feelings to themselves, do the job and make it look easy. Scott got the standard hero's welcome, but NASA made sure he never flew again. Russians chalk up another victory in the space race as they put two manned spacecraft into orbit within 24 hours of each other. Two spacecraft up at once, within sight of each other. That might mean rendezvous, and rendezvous was a big step toward the moon. Tracking stations indicate that there is little doubt of the success of the Russian feat that is seen as two years ahead of the U.S. effort. Now the Russians were flying for days at a time we could only manage a few hours. After nearly losing Scott Carpenter, the program had to regain credibility. On our next flight, we had to perform better and stay up longer. And Wally Shira was the guy to do it. Typical Wally. He cut out every science experiment he could. He had one goal, to fly the perfect mission. And he did it, a textbook flight. But the world hardly noticed. Wally had splashed down in the middle of the Cuban Missile Crisis. The Cuban Missile Crisis brought it home. Before cosmonauts and astronauts, the original payloads were nuclear warheads. Now we were eyeball to eyeball. Good evening, my fellow citizens. This government, as promised, has maintained the closest surveillance of the Soviet military buildup on the island of Cuba. Luckily for us, the Russians blinked. They took their missiles home. At least for now, life and the space race would go on. Do you recognize this man? He's astronaut Alan Shepard, America's first man in space. America had space fever. The Mercury 7 were the biggest celebrities around. And we knew it. NASA needed us. And we never let them forget it. We'd become much more than test pilots. We were carrying the image of the whole space program on our shoulders. I remember thinking in the early days, what a force we could be within NASA if we all presented a unified stand. And it occurred to me that uh, we were the most powerful entity within NASA and that NASA had a tiger by the tail in this group of seven astronauts. NASA was beginning to wish we were a little less famous and a lot easier to control. They decided they'd bring in a chaperone, some army general, to make us toe the line. Well, that went over like a turd in a punch bowl. Then somebody had a bright idea. We began to think, do we want an outsider to do this, or should we have one of us do it? And that's when the seven of us got together and decided we better have Deke do this. The six of them wanted to put me in charge of the astronaut office. The guys were kind of throwing me a bone and solving their astronaut boss problem, all in one neat package. But if the Mercury 6 thought I was going to be a rubber stamp boss, they were in for a surprise. They thought with Deke that he would simply be the Wisconsin farm boy that would come in and sort of a figure hit. But they didn't know what a manager and what type of a person Deke Slayton was, what a doer he was. He wound up selecting the crews. I didn't want the job I had, but I was going to do it the best way I could. And sure enough, I got tested right off the bat. Gordo Cooper was going to wrap up the Mercury program with our most daring flight yet, 36 hours in space. It was four times longer than we'd ever flown, and a lot longer than the Mercury spacecraft was originally meant to fly. So Gordo had a little fun with the name. He called it Faith Seven. NASA wasn't amused. Gordo had a habit of stepping on NASA's toes. Nobody questioned his ability, 
just his judgment. Typical Gordo. Two days before his flight, he came roaring in low over the launch complex, practically scared the pants off the flight director, Walt Williams. He showed unusually bad judgment in that he flew at a low altitude close to the administration building, so low, in fact, that when Walt Williams looked out the window, here's this jet streaking by below his altitude. Yeah. He went back to headquarters, he called me up and he said, Shepard, is your suit ready? And I said, well, I mean, of course my suit's ready. He says, well, I'm pulling Gordo off the flight, you're going. <laughs> Walt was dead serious about replacing Cooper with Shepard. And he'd have done it, too, except it wasn't his job anymore, it was mine. And even though he got carried away, I knew pulling Gordo off that flight would kill his astronaut career. I wasn't going to do that. Gordo's flight went perfect for the first 30 hours. Then all of a sudden, the man in the can had some real work to do. I wonder if uh, you'd relay to the Cape uh, a little situation I had to and see what they think on it. System by system, the spacecraft started dying. Autopilot dead. Attitude readings dead. Electrical systems all dead. Well, things are beginning to stack up a little. ASCS inverter is uh, acting up, and my CO2 is building up in the suit, and my inverter won't come on the line. And other than that, things are fine. About the only thing still working up there was Gordo, but he was about to attempt a completely manual re-entry, something no one had ever done before. I'm looking for lots of experience on this flight. Get He'd only get one chance. If he was off, he'd burn alive. Everything that should have been automatic, he had to do himself. All he had was a wristwatch on his arm for timing, eyeballs on the horizon for alignment, and finger on the button to fire his retro rockets. And he did it perfect. Right on the old bazoo, the Oklahoma hot dog landed closer to the carrier than anyone else. Gordo's performance was the ultimate proof of how well a man can fly a spacecraft. Why you needed men there in the first place. One of the things which uh, warmed us the most during this flight was the realization that however extraordinary computers may be, that we are still ahead of them and that man is still the most extraordinary computer of all. Project Mercury ended on a great note and John Kennedy seemed to be as pleased as we were. He came down to the Cape to have a look at the huge new Saturn booster they were building for the moon shots. His baby. It was November 18th, 1963. Kennedy put his hands in his coat pocket and leaned back on the heels and looked up to that uh, huge uh, first uh, stage of Saturn. And I could just see in his eyes that uh, he, he just loved the whole thing. This was, this was romance. This was out there with Alexander the Great and Napoleon. The conquest of space must and will go ahead. That much we know. That much we can say with confidence. He gave a speech, and it was the story of, uh, of these two boys and how they would go across the Irish countryside and when they ran into a, a fence or an obstacle. And when they came to an orchard wall that seemed too high, too doubtful to try. One of the boys would grab the other's hat and throw it over the wall, and then they would have to climb the wall to retrieve the cap. Kennedy's uh, analogy was, we have thrown our cap over the wall. We're going for it. This nation has tossed its cap over the wall of space, and we have no choice but to follow it. And then the next day, of course, he was dead, killed. The Hasbro shooting, Portland Hospital has been advised to stand by for a severe gunshot wound. A priest has been ordered. Emergency supplies of blood also being rushed to the hospital. The President of the United States is dead.
terrible news. But I got to tell you, after the shock, my first thought was, what will this do to the program? I knew we'd lost a big fan. It was my feeling that he was really a space cadet because he was excited about what men had done and could do in space. We were his favorites. We were part of his little group. And all of us felt very comfortable with the President of the United States, like he was a buddy. We must assure our preeminence in the peaceful exploration of outer space, focusing on an expedition to the moon in this decade. Lyndon Johnson. If there was a bigger fan of space than Kennedy, it had to be old Lyndon. But now with Kennedy gone, meeting his deadline meant more than ever. We felt like we owed it to him. The program was really gearing up. Now with Mercury over, we entered the next phase, Project Gemini. Mr. Neil A. Armstrong, Air Force Major Frank Borman. The Gemini 9, rookies here to make their mark. The Mercury guys welcomed them with all the warmth of a pit bull on a short leash. It was more than competitive. It was psychological. It was, uh, well, we're anointed, you're not, you've got to pay your dues. I mean, these weren't expressed, and it wasn't written in any order. But I have never seen a group of people stiff-arm another group like that. The nine looked up to the seven as more or less the, the, their mentors, and probably the seven said, hey, we can handle all this ourselves. Why do we need these nine guys? The fact was, we did need these new guys. The new Gemini program had to test and prove every technique we would need to reach the moon. Project Gemini, a step which will Could we maneuver spacecraft with precision? Could we rendezvous and dock two ships together? Could our bodies and our minds survive 14 days of weightlessness, the length of time a trip to the moon would take? And could we leave the safety of the spacecraft to walk and work in space? If we failed any one of these, we weren't going to the moon. Two test pilots in a Gemini capsule was going to be a tight fit. We could really have used an extra room just for their egos. When we started flying spacecraft with more than one person in it, uh, obviously, we had to have titles for the people. Uh, the natural title would be pilot and co-pilot. No one in the astronaut corps wanted to be called a co-pilot, so scratching their heads, management came up with commander and pilot. There was no debate about who would command the first Gemini mission. It was Al Shepard all the way, America's first man in space. I wouldn't have it any other way. God knows neither would Al. We had been training, oh, I guess, uh, perhaps a couple of months, and uh, got up one morning, uh, walking to the bathroom, and all of a sudden, I lost, totally lost my balance. It was almost as if uh, I was spinning. Of course, I wasn't. But I, uh, I, I steadied myself and thought, well, gosh, I didn't really drink that much last night. An inner ear problem, Meniere's disease. It knocked Al flat on his butt and right off flight status. Dizzy spells, disorientation. He wasn't flying anywhere. Well, after the initial shock wore off, uh, the initial shock, of course, was total disbelief that they could ground the, the best pilot they ever had. I told him I'd been flying fighter planes and I'd been a test pilot all of my life and uh, I'd fly the damn thing upside down, uh, right side up, didn't make a difference to me. He was grounded. I knew if Al couldn't fly, he'd go nuts being on the sidelines. So I asked him to join me running the astronaut office until he could get the medics off his back. Al and I were both out. The original seven were down to five. And then we lost another. Is there a possibility that you would go back to the space agency? There was a rumor going around that NASA was nervous about risking John Glenn's life on another flight. He was a lot more useful as a living hero than as a dead martyr. So they offered him a desk job. For me to stick around being the world's oldest permanent training used second-hand astronaut, whatever, 
I didn't want to really do that. The man who hurtled to fame as the first American to orbit the Earth tosses his space helmet into the ring as a political candidate. Lieutenant Colonel... Now Gus Grissom would fly the first Gemini. Gus took John Young with him, the first of the rookies to fly in space. Gemini was a sports car compared to Mercury. Uh, roger pitch. How you aim, Ollie Brown? Everything worked great. The Gemini program was off to a beautiful start. And then the Russians walked. As the second column of the Santa Fe Alexia left the spaceship. He was wearing a special space suit. They were first in space, first to orbit, first woman in space, and all of a sudden here's another another first for the Russian program. Every time we step forward, it seemed like they were taking two steps. Even in our most ambitious plans, we hadn't thought of sending a man outside for months. Now, that would have to change. The Russian spacewalk was their most impressive first since Sputnik. We had to respond on our next flight, Gemini 4, months ahead of schedule. We did. Space is the enemy of life. No air, full of radiation. In shade, you'd freeze to death. In direct sun, you'd burn up. For years, everything we did was designed to protect us from it. Now we were opening the hatch, and Ed White was putting his head right in the dragon's mouth. I'm under my own control. We held our breath. Okay. So far, so good. Okay, I'm coming over. I feel like a million dollars. This is the greatest experience I've just remembered. I think that once you get out and float, thinking that you're a couple hundred miles up in space and there's nothing below you except way below, and, and it's, it's sort of a tranquil or lethargic experience that you sort of want to you know, just enjoy it. Right now, I'm standing on my head. I'm looking right down. It looks like we're coming up on the coast of California. Ed White's spacewalk was a triumph. Everyone was dazzled, and it seemed so easy. Scratch one obstacle on the way to the moon. Six months later, Wally Shira and Tom Stafford tackled the next Gemini goal. Rendezvous with another vehicle. They were going to meet up with Gemini 7, flown by Frank Borman and Jim Lovell. It would test a critical step on the way to the moon. This was the kind of mission Wally loved. Pure precision flying with almost no science experiments. We're cleared for takeoff. We're at your audio minus five, four, three, two, one. Ignition. Ignition. But no liftoff. It just sat there, and we waited for it to blow. Wally and Tom were left sitting on a ticking bomb, a mountain of high explosive fuel, just waiting for the spark. Perfect countdown, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Clock started, no lift off. It was much more traumatic than that, of course. But it happened, the engines came up to speed, and it stopped. And but logic, this is all millisecond logic, said, hey, we haven't lifted off. If we had lifted off, and it started to shut down, our recourse was to eject out of there, and I would pull this ring between my legs and it would eject both of us out from the spacecraft. The statistics were that 75% of ejections were successful, and the definition of successful was that the guy didn't get killed. Wally ignored the rules and followed his instinct. He didn't pull the escape ring. It was a gutsy move. All packs are ready. Okay, no problem on this plane? Negative. Okay, we're just sitting here breathing. Instinct. Man over machine. If that ejection system had been automatic, it had been blasted out of the spacecraft, wrecking it, the mission, and their bodies. Instead, 
Three days later, Wally and Tom were back on their way, headed for Gemini 7. We were about to find out if our moon plan had a chance. It all depended on two vehicles meeting up in the vastness of space. If we couldn't rendezvous, we'd have to rethink our whole approach. They had to find each other, close in and hold formation, all at over 17,000 miles an hour. 7 and 6, would you continue with the description of your station keeping? Wally and Tom met up with Frank and Jim as if they'd done it a hundred times before. Precision flying at over 17,000 miles an hour. It was a long way from monkeys on automatic pilot. This was what we had signed up for. Gemini 6 went home, leaving Frank Borman and Jim Lovell to take a crack at the next Gemini go. Duration. Could their bodies last a full 14 days in space? The length of a round trip flight to the moon. The doctors worried about their bodies. I worried about their sanity. Two test pilot egos locked for two weeks in a space the size of a phone booth. Well, nobody ever really slept because uh, the activity of the other person would continually wake up the person that was trying to sleep. It was the beginning of a beautiful relationship. Fourteen days in a Gemini spacecraft is a very, very trying experience. Being 14 days with Frank Borman any place was wild, so... <laughs> I think Jim Lovell brought uh, Mark Twain's roughing it, <laughs> which was apropos. <laughs> but I don't believe we read it much. There was a song that was uh, sung by Nat King Cole. Uh, and uh, and I, I'm trying to think of what the name of it was. We sang it for 14 days, sang... It's put your sweet lips a little closer to the phone. Nat King Cole. Put your sweet lips a little closer to the phone. Put your sweet Let's lips a little closer to the phone. Let's just... pretend that we're together all alone. <laughs> that went on for two weeks. And of course, Borman and I were alone. <laughs> See, I, I'd forgotten all about that. You're exactly right. <laughs> Frank and Jim were guinea pigs. The doctors were taking bets on what would happen when they landed. Odds were they'd be in pretty bad shape. Some thought they might not survive. I remember when we were back on Earth, I looked at Lovell, and Lovell looked at me, and we said, well, I said, you're going to pass out? And he said, no, and we were fine. <laughs> yeah, well, we uh, held hands and said we want to tell the world that we're engaged. <laughs> I actually had to command my legs, left, right, left, right, as I walked across the carrier deck. My uh, wife took a look at the movies, and she said it looked to me like I had my pants full as I was leaned over and just, you know, trudging along like a little boy would do with his pants full. So much for medical fears. Now we knew man wouldn't be the weak link going to the moon. Jim and I was on a roll, cracking a new problem every three months. Next up was docking, physically joining two spacecraft together. Well, Houston, this is Gemini 8. Uh, we're station keeping on the Eugene at about 150 feet. Gemini 8 would dock with an unmanned Agena booster. Boy, look at that. Man, that's great. Man, that is really slick. Commander was a young civilian named Neil Armstrong. He'd had a pilot's license since he was 16, flew fighters in Korea, and tested X-15s at Edwards. Okay, Gemini 8, uh, we have cams solid. You're looking good on the ground. Go ahead and dock. We fight, we are down. Congratulations, this is real good. <laughs> then, without warning, they started spinning out of control. They were going faster than the whirly gig at the county fair. Neil undocked and pulled back. But that only made it worse. Much worse. Well, we got serious problems here. We're just going to stop on Andover Amp and we're going to engage from the Agena. A thruster was stuck. They were doing a somersault every second and getting faster all the time. At this rate, they'd pass out. And that'd be all she wrote. As a last resort, Neil fired his re-entry thrusters. It worked. Now they had to get down immediately. 
5,000 miles off course and in the wrong ocean. But they were safe. Spacewalking, rendezvous, long duration, docking. We'd tried out everything we'd need to reach the moon. And we still had four Gemini missions left. The moon was looking closer all the time. Astronauts Tom Stafford and Gene Cernan are suited up, ready to go. We would use the last Gemini flights to practice the one minor detail left, working in space. Ed White had made it look easy, but all he did was float around. Now Gene Cernan would try a few simple jobs, open valves, tighten fittings, just to prove when we got to the moon we could work there. There's even time for a joke with a giant match, an obvious sign of a relaxed, confident pre-flight mood. We were all sure it would be easy. We were all dead wrong. Tom Stafford reports that uh, Cernan is encountering some fogging up of the visor. They are keeping the... When I would turn the valve, if, if I wasn't uh, held in my position in some way or another, I, I'd turn the valve and the valve was a little tough to turn it would turn me back and my body would would float away and you start tumbling and you start rolling in zero gravity gene was having a wrestling match with himself he was using all of his energy just to try to stay still never mind do any work okay he's fogging real bad I lost 13 pounds. That's an awful lot of weight. I ended up with 100% humidity in my suit, and my entire visor got completely fogged over. Gene was totally blinded by the visor. He was physically exhausted near collapse, and getting back in that spacecraft was something no one else could do for him. They said if something happened and fella was hung up outside that uh, we were to not do anything rash but we would have to to uh, eventually uh, release him and close the hatch and bring the vehicle back there's no way Tom could have re-entered successfully had he been towing me behind him. First of all, I would have burned up and been killed during re-entry. So what, what's the use of going through that? Second of all, he probably would have burned up himself. He would not have been able to close the hatch. And so instead of losing one man, we would have lost two. Blinded, almost passing out, Gino finally made it back inside. We were starting to realize there was a lot about working in space we just didn't understand. Now, let's just sit down and take a rest. When Dick Gordon tried it on Gemini 11, he just about lost it, too. How you doing? Tired, Keith. All right, just rest. Working in space was looking like the showstopper. We had guys exhausting themselves almost into unconsciousness. If we couldn't get out and work, going to the moon would be nothing but sightseeing trip. Obviously, we needed to rethink the problem. It was time for a new angle, a different take, a different kind of guy, a really different kind of guy. I think I understood the, the importance of being gentle and delicate and, and in control of the momentum or the mass of the body uh, during spacewalks, I think I understood that just intuitively. These things were natural to me. <clears throat> they obviously were not natural to the Navy people who were trying to do spacewalking. So uh, their uh, overconfident attitude got them into trouble. Buzz was a mechanical genius. His IQ must be sky high. He was the first PhD pilot in the program. PhDs always kind of had a certain shock value in the, particularly among the Slaytons and the Shepherds who, who knew they were a hell of a lot smarter than all the PhDs in the world. Buzz was our MIT scientist pilot. He was smart, he was inventive, and some thought he was arrogant as hell. He got tagged from the day he arrived. 
Gus Grissom and I were part of an interview team for a new group of astronauts, and Buzz Aldrin came in to our interview just for Gus and me, and sport coat, shirt and tie, and around his tie is this little chain thing hanging from the chain or Air Force wings, below it, a Phi Beta Kappa gate. Gus looks up and said, Aldrin, we've already read your resume. Why the hell are you wearing it? Buzz was absolutely certain he could do it better, way better. He threw out the pulley system we'd been using for training. Then he threw a space capsule in a swimming pool and went in after it. Right before our eyes, he invented the art of working in space. Buzz got together tools like he was fixing to climb Mount Everest. Footholds, handholds, Velcro grips, bungee cords. By the time he was ready to go, he looked like Mr. Goodwrench. Buzz was like a human fly, working out there for hours and having a ball. He made it look easy. For him, it was. Gemini 12, Houston Capcom, one minute to LOS. New EVA record, beautiful job. Say what you want about Buzz Aldrin, but be sure to add the word successful. He succeeded where everyone else failed and put us back on track toward the moon. The Gemini program was an unqualified success. It was on to Apollo. In Mercury and Gemini, a total of 26 astronauts have logged a total of 1,900 hours in space covering 35 million miles. Gemini has demonstrated the feasibility of almost everything we plan to do in Apollo. Gentlemen, the Gemini program is now officially completed. In the five and a half years since Al Shepard's flight, we'd come a long way. We hadn't heard from the Russians in a while. For all we knew, we were ahead. We'd learned a few lessons the hard way, paid some dues. The moon now seemed so close, we felt like we could touch it. But we'd soon find out, on our first attempt, we'd almost push it away forever. A lot had changed since I started out. Back then, the only thing that mattered was flying. That's me, Slayton, Major Donald Kay. My friends call me Deke. Going faster, farther, higher was all we cared about. Ten years had passed. Now it was 1967. The moon was the center of my life. And right then, it felt pretty damn close. Down on pad 34, the moon rocket was ready for its first flight. Pad 34. Man, if this place could talk. So you took the vet down with the top down, you had the little walk around the ventilator? Old stories still being told. These guys remember. Some of my good buddies. Scotty, John, Gordo, and old Al. Alan B. Shepard, America's first man in space. He and I were the only ones from that first group to see it all. Gus was a man of a few words, but you could hang your hat on anything he said. 
Gus, uh, what do you think your chances are for an Apollo flight? I think they're pretty good. I expect to be around for most of the Apollo program. You think you will one day make one of the trips to the moon, then? Uh, I'm, I'm planning on it. Gus Grissom. <laughs> Not much on water skis, but a hell of a pilot and a damn good engineer. He liked to have a good time as much as the rest of us. But when it came to work, there was an intensity you could cut with a knife. Gus was a charger. He was uh, a very uh, macho type. He was really the typical test pilot. But he also had go fever. You know, he wanted to get it going. He wanted to get up there and do the job. Gus was our second man in space, and he flew a perfect mission. But that wasn't what people remembered. What they remembered was he'd lost his ship. And somehow, Gus got tagged with making a mistake because he lost the spacecraft, and you were not allowed a mistake. Was I, did I feel that I was in danger at any time during the flight or in the water? Well, I was scared a good portion of the time. I guess this is a pretty good indication. You were what? Scared. <laughs> OK. Test pilots lose planes. It happens. But this wasn't the test pilot business anymore. This was the astronaut business. When it goes right, you get a parade and a trip to the White House. When it goes wrong, you get a reputation. It hurt him very, very much. It's very easy to blame the astronaut, but that wasn't Gus. Gus was much too great an engineer and too serious a pilot. He got tagged as the astronaut who'd lost his ship. Gus hated the reputation, but he didn't run away from it. He stuck it right in everybody's face. On his next flight, he named his spacecraft the unsinkable Molly Brown. Gus was very intense. Very, very intense about the problem he had with his Mercury flight, very intense about sort of disappearing out of the system. So he made his Gemini flight a perfect Gemini flight. This time, the ending was perfect, too. After splashdown, he got seasick, puked his guts out but he wouldn't open that hatch until the chopper had a firm grip on the capsule. He'd made his point. Gus wanted that first Apollo ride. Now he would get it. Apollo, a moon ship for a half million mile journey. The most impressive flying machine ever built. It made the Mercuries and Geminis we'd been flying look like something from the Wright brothers. This was probably the most complex thing ever put together by humans. As much technology as a nuclear submarine crammed into the package the size of a minivan. The electrical system alone had 30 miles of wire. I'm real pleased to be on a first flight. Looking forward to it. Just now, started getting into the uh, Apollo systems and looking at Apollo spacecraft and trying to forget everything I knew about Gemini. I think we've got a real good crew with Ed and Roger. Ed White was the best athlete in the astronaut corps and the first American to walk in space. A real mom and apple pie type. After John Glenn left the program, Ed stepped right into his shoes. I had a great faith in the people and the equipment that we were using for the mission. I had a great faith in myself and especially in Jim. And also, I think I had a great faith in my own God. I remember after his flight, he insisted on putting in his life personal contract story the question of how did you feel when you got out on the first spacewalk. And he told the life reporter, I felt red, white, and blue all over. And I went to Ed and I said, come on, Ed, we're all patriotic, but that's bullshit. He said, nope, that stays. I feel like a million dollars. Just like that. That's the way I felt. Roger Chaffee had flown a U-2 over Cuba during the missile crisis. He took the pictures of the Russian rockets Kennedy showed on TV. Apollo 1 would be his first space flight. There was a lot to learn, but not enough hours in the day to learn it. But there was no time to slow down. We were on a roll. On top of that, there was always the Russians. They were never far from our thoughts. We had a general idea what the Soviets were doing. What I don't know is 
Do you ever remember getting a briefing with anybody in the CIA uh, that would give us uh, an inkling as to what the Soviets were doing back in those days? No, I think, uh, We knew that they were planning to go to the moon. We had satellite photographs at that time that showed us the development of their launch stand. Then they also showed us the vehicle as it was brought into position. The Russians weren't the only pressure. We'd been keeping our heads down since 1959, eating, sleeping, breathing space flight. While we weren't looking, America had changed. The worst race riots since those two years ago in the Washington While we'd been trying to figure out how to join spacecraft together, the country was figuring out how to tear itself apart. A lot of our friends were fighter pilots, and they were starting to get shot down over a place called Vietnam. President Johnson was feeling the heat. He thought it was about time America got some good news. He looked around and NASA seemed like a pretty good messenger. Everybody had go fever, meaning, we've got to go, we've got to keep up with the schedule, we've got to get to the moon and back before the end of this decade. We're on a timeline. We've got to do these things in this order. If we don't do them right now in this order, we're going to lose our place. We'll slip the launch. We were only too eager to deliver. That wasn't the problem. The problem was that shiny new moon ship so far, the Apollo 1 spacecraft looked a hell of a lot better than it performed. The spacecraft had been delivered, but of course we had lived with it for, you know, many, many months before at the uh, contractor's plant, uh, North American Rockwell. And we knew that the spacecraft was, you know, in poor shape relative to what it ought to be. We felt like we could fly it, but let's face it, it just wasn't as good as uh, it should have been for the job of flying the first manned Apollo mission. We were dealing with new contractors who had their own ideas on how they were going to do things. All of the history of Mercury and Gemini was put aside, and the knowledge of the people that got us that far was also put aside. You don't throw your history away, you learn from it, and that's what I called it Project Appalling. Late January, four weeks to launch, we were working around the clock, testing system by system. We were going very fast. NASA was behind schedule, as always. And we were running tests without taking time to really look at the data. The last check was called the plugs out test, a full dress rehearsal for launch. It was a Friday at the end of an awfully long week, and we were tired. We all had our eyes on the weekend. In the morning, when the crew came in to the office, you know, you, I sensed something. I don't know what it was that I sensed, but I picked up something from all three of them. There was a quietness about them. Instead of being ready for a test where they usually just get up and bounce out the door, it was just, it, it was something they didn't want to do. Their attitude was 180 from anything I've ever seen before. It would be actual flight conditions. Crew in full suits, capsule under its own power. 100% oxygen inside, and the hatch sealed. It's not a normal work day. You know, you stayed there till a test was done, which meant that you might be in that spacecraft 18, 20 hours. It was a long, arduous test. This one was no different. We'd been going since 6 in the morning. I said to Gus, if it doesn't check out well, if you have a glitch or an anomaly, get the hell out of there. Hell, he wasn't going to do that. 
that would have brought the program to a stop and everybody said, well, that chicken shit guy and, and all that kind of stuff. You've got a cast of thousands geared up to perform a test and you're critical to that test and here you are, you've worked all day long and you're down to the last half hour, last hour. It's very difficult to just say, hey, I'm putting everything to a stop here. I was in the blockhouse with Stu Russo late Friday afternoon. We had some communication problems. We were having trouble. We were testing out the various uh, loops and, and radios. Hey guys, how are we going to get to the moon if we can't talk between two buildings? I can hear you saying. Uh, did you guys say something from the command module? I said, how are we going to get to the moon if we can't talk between two buildings? The test was dragging on, one glitch after another. Most of us had already called to say we wouldn't be home for dinner. And then it happened. Down under Gus's seat, somewhere in 30 miles of wire, there was a short circuit. In the blockhouse, all we saw was another glitch on the meter. Nobody knew it then, but a spark had jumped out. It landed and sat there, in the pure oxygen. At 15 pounds pressure, it glowed. Brighter and brighter. And then it went. Like a blowtorch. called for medics and raced over to the pad. The radio was dead, but I still hadn't given up on the crew. In their suits, I figured maybe they still had a chance. The pad guys were burning their hands trying to get the damned hatch off, choking in toxic smoke. Almost as fast as it started, the fire was out. Finally, they got the hatch off. And then we knew. Most of their suits were still white. Uh, you did not look in and see charred bodies. We always expected to lose someone, someday, but not on the ground. That was not a way to die, not for a test pilot. The moon that had seemed so close now had vanished from sight. T-38 and flew to the Cape and I, uh, I never will forget that flight. Within hours of the fire, we had put Frank Borman in charge of our investigation. All along the way, the controllers were saying, you know, we're sorry and this and that. To me, that portrayed the whole feeling of the country. It was an enormous setback and everybody felt it. I mean, we were really shocked because we had just left the guys and come back. And none of us could talk. I mean, we just kind of just looked at each other. Eyes were full of pain. Devastating to the people in the program. I mean, just devastating. I mean, sent a wave of pain. Oh, I'll never forget the pain in Al Shepard's eyes and his face. I'll never forget that. I got that. home, boy, I lost it all. I, that was a very traumatic experience. That was 
You know, you kept going, what could I have done? What could we have done? Just was one of the seven. I mean, there was a bonding there that they had, no matter what ever happened. The seven original astronauts were now six. I think the American public is mature enough to recognize that it's an important program, and it's a program that must go on. And if something should happen, why, well, it happened. We still have to go on living every day, and we go on and uh, continue the program. I remember that Max Fugier and Deke Slayton and I, we were at the Cape for the investigation. We went out one night and got bombed. Uh, I'm not proud to say I don't drink anymore, but we got bombed that night. Ended up throwing glasses like a, like a scene out of an old World War I movie. But then the next day, that was it. It was back to work on a new and painful job. How could it have happened? Everybody put aside what they'd been doing and started looking for answers. But as soon as we stopped and looked at what we'd been doing, really looked, the answers were suddenly very clear. We had crap in that spacecraft that wouldn't quit. It had a big sponge foam pad, highly combustible. We had Velcro. The thing was wallpapered with Velcro, with an adhesive that was highly flammable and toxic. Everything was wrong. Everything was wrong. We put 100% oxygen into that vehicle and then pressurized it. Now, we'd done that all through Gemini, all through Mercury, and we were doing that in Apollo. And nobody stood up and said, hey, you guys know what you got when you pressurize 100% oxygen? You, you got a bomb sitting there. Sure, we took risks. It's part of the job. You don't always know how it'll turn out. But there was something else. The insane work schedule. The disease we called go fever. We got in too much of a goddamn hurry. We were willing to put up with a lot of poor hardware and poor preparation in order to try to get on with the job, and a lot of us knew that we were doing that. That time frame was the worst I can remember. I was grounded, Shepard was grounded, and now the whole damn space program was grounded. I was miserable, but Al was worse, and he took it out on everybody. I was just mad at the world. I rapidly became known as the icy commander with not too much allowance for mistakes or frivolity or lack of performance among the astronauts. I'm sure the American public will greatly appreciate seeing the real Alan Shepard. I remember he'd walk into the astronaut office and he'd walk in with his briefcase and slam it down on a desk and the other astronauts would sit in the room and they'd kind of just kind of, well, he's in that kind of a mood today. We had an arrangement with Lola Morrow that uh, have her put on the door a smiling owl or a very steely-eyed owl, a picture. Many times the guys wouldn't even make it by the secretary's desk. They'd just take one look at the picture, turn around, and leave the icy commander to his own devices. I can remember a time or two when I was walking down the hall and I saw Al coming out and I'd break off into another hallway and go around. On the sixth anniversary of his Mercury flight, we threw a party, put a little movie together to remind him of his flight status. Only two had gone before, fellow pioneers into the unknown, Pam and Enos. Al studied their training procedures. He utilized their proven medical staff. And I had thought briefly about getting up and interrupting at the microphone. But all of a sudden, I realized there were two guys standing behind me, each of them weighed about 250 pounds, and there was no way that Shepard was going to get out of that chair. Good old Al, 
Six years an astronaut, 15 minutes in space. He got the message. The icy commander loosened up. But that didn't make time go any faster. The new spacecraft was still a year away. And the Russians were up to something. The biggest rocket ever launched, capable of reaching the moon. All we knew at the time was that it had gone into Earth orbit. The pilot was named Vladimir Komarov. After it was all over, we learned the full story. His spacecraft started spinning out of control. The ground crew did all they could, but it was no use. They knew he wasn't going to make it. Premier Kosygin told him he'd get a hero's burial. And he got his wife on the radio to say goodbye. But he said he wasn't ready to die just yet. He fought the controls, and against all odds, he managed to re-enter safely. The chute popped out right on schedule. But just when it looked like he'd made it, that chute got twisted up like a washcloth being wrung out. It never opened. They kept their promise. They buried him a hero. We are very saddened by the loss of Colonel Komarov. We feel comradeship for this test pilot because we've met several of his fellow cosmonauts. I couldn't escape the irony. Both sides racing forward at breakneck speed, both stumbling at the same moment. The only question now was, who'd get up first? And his fellow cosmonauts. October 1968, 21 months since the fire. Apollo was ready to try again. Sitting on the Saturn rocket was the brand new spacecraft. We felt like the spacecraft that we were going to fly was such a difference and a marked change and an upgrade from what had essentially killed uh, you know, Gus and Roger and Ed that we were very pleased. I mean, we thought we had a wonderful flying machine and all we had to do was to go out and prove that in fact that it was a wonderful flying machine. <laughs> Apollo 7 was ready. The commander would be one of the original Mercury astronauts. The program's rebirth was riding on his shoulders. The stage was set for the return of Wally Shira. I had fun with Mercury. I had fun with Gemini. I lose a buddy, my next door neighbor, Gus, one of our seven. I lose two other guys I thought the world of. And I, I began to realize this was no longer fun. I was now assigned a mission where I had to put it back on track like Humpty Dumpty. Everyone felt the change. The old Wally loved to joke around. The new Wally was dead serious. He wanted to keep the mission simple. He was tough, and he was in charge. Finally, 21 months after the fire, we were back. The new Apollo moon ship was in Earth orbit and flying beautifully. Flying with Wally were two rookies, Walt Cunningham and Don Isley. To them, Wally was the old master. Wally liked center stage, and the first Apollo flight uh, was going to be center stage, and Wally's juices were flowing again. The flight was going like clockwork. Then Mission Control wanted to change the flight plan. Experiments, little jobs that had nothing to do with flying. Just the kind of thing Wally always hated. He called them junk, and he had had enough. They decided on a Saturday morning, we launched on a Friday, to turn on television. I was asleep, and Don Isley was on watch. And I heard Don saying something about, Wally's not going to like that. Uh, Roger, regarding the, uh, the flight plan uh, problem here, uh, we would just ask to reconsider that. And, and they said, well, the... NASA PR guys want to have television today because they've got some quiet time. They can, get, they can get national media. I said, sorry about that, guys. We're not ready yet. Well, we have a new vehicle up here. And I'll tell you, this first TV will be delayed without any further discussion until after the rendezvous. All right, you're copy. From then on, it was one thing after another. The first war in space. 
and the Russians weren't even involved. Okay, Don. Uh, go ahead, Wally. Uh, I've had it up here today. And uh, from now on, I'm going to be an onboard flight director for these updates. We're not going to accept any new games, like getting 50 feet to the Delta Z Tower for a burn, or doing some crazy tests we've never heard of before. Uh, and right, the result, uh, each test is going to be reviewed thoroughly before we act on it. I was the flight director, the prime flight director, and I was on console at the time. And uh, I was pissed off about it. That was an affront and inappropriate and, frankly, insubordinate. Don and I would just, you know, kind of look at each other and cringe inside uh, at, at some of the exchanges that were going on. Uh, keep in mind that, you know, Wally had been around. This was his third mission, and uh, he was kind of the, you know, the cock of the walk, or at least he thought he was. They were fighting like children, and I was in the middle. I'd never seen Wally so cranky before. But then Wally had never had a head cold in space before. I've taken two aspirin, and I'm wondering if there's anything else I can take. Roger. Uh, Wally, uh, Houston here. Uh, good doctors are recommending that you take one Actifed. Hey, listen, uh, let's go over this reentry thing one more time since we've got a little slack here and uh, good communications. Let me tell you, one of the things I plan on doing uh, after we break off the uh, runs today is put on my suit and see how we stand in the couch with the helmet off. Right. The last straw was over the helmets, and it was a real battle. Mission rules said keep them on during reentry, but with Wally's cold, he wanted to be able to hold his nose to clear the pressure in his ears. In this case, I had a cold, and I felt that I had enough discussion with the ground. I didn't have much more time to talk about whether they're going to put the helmet on or off, leave the bubble helmet on or off. I said, essentially, I'm on board. I'm commanding. They could wear all the black armbands they wanted if I was lost or lost my hearing, but I had the responsibility for living through the mission. Finally, Chris Kraft gave a direct order. Wear the helmet. Wally gave a direct answer. No way. That's pure bullshit. I think Shira was paranoid. <laughs> what just something nice about me? <laughs> Apollo 7 was the only flight of its type. It was the only time when, in flight, the flight crews were openly difficult to deal with and hostile towards some of the things that we were trying to do. Paranoid and Jekyll Hyde might come out of all that, but. I really wanted to do everything perfectly. The flight was a complete success, and 10 days of bickering were finally over. Deke took Wally into one of the rooms, and Wally and Deke had it out. Wally and I had a little talk, but it didn't do much good. Before they'd even lifted off, Wally had announced it would be his last flight. He was beyond discipline. But Chris Kraft had to have discipline. Astronauts obey orders or they don't fly. So Walt and Don were the scapegoats. I learned at one time that Chris Kraft had listened to all of this nonsense going back and forth from the ground to the spacecraft and said that, that he didn't want any of those guys ever flying for him again. Chris has denied that, that he ever said that. I said the only way Cunningham will ever fly again is over my dead body. And he called me on the phone and asked me if that was the case, and I said, you got it straight from the horse's mouth. The two other guys never did fly again. But Wally? <laughs> well, he went on to achieve a different kind of fame. It's the nasal decongestant antihistamine tablet. The great line, of course, where I got a Clio for that, was, did you ever sneeze in one of these? And here's that same bubble helmet. <laughs> Can you imagine sneezing in one of these? I'm Wally Shira. Suffering cold symptoms in space can't be fun. It was, it was only three weeks after my flight. We still sit around and talk about it. How we devoted eight years of our lives to the space program. Yet the moon seemed further away than ever. I figured we'd, uh, us old guys would be retired by then. These, and these young guys, these young guys could do it. How'd you sneak back in there? Yeah, very, very lucky to do it. It was the attitude everybody had. But then all the work started to pay off. There was a change. Things started coming together.
We knew the spacecraft could do its job. All we needed now was a rocket. The Saturn V, it would carry the spacecraft, the lunar lander, the crew, and everything they would need for a trip across half a million miles. Two weeks in deep space. The biggest rocket ever made. It had to lift 50 tons straight in the air, not counting its own weight, and push it up to 24,000 miles an hour. It was an unbelievable, tremendous creation. It was real. The Saturn V was alive. You know, you'd almost had to fall in love with that beast to feel comfortable riding on top of it. So I guess the thing that probably uh, hit me more strongly than anything else was that I want to be on one of those things, and I kept thinking, that was our outlet to the moon. But it had never been tested, and nobody was going to ride it until it had. There were only two years left in Kennedy's decade. If this thing worked, we had a shot at the moon. If not, all the improvements we made to the brand new Apollo spacecraft wouldn't mean a damn thing. It was time to light the candle. was the biggest rocket in the world. And finally, it was operational. It had been 10 years since Sputnik started the whole race. We hadn't heard from the Russians in a while, but after all our hard work and all our success, it was going to come right down to the wire. We were told by Deke the CIA had the uh, indication that the Russians were going to try to circumnavigate the moon prior to the end of 68. And that was a driving force and I think one of the major considerations in the Apollo 8 decision. Well, for once, let's preempt them. I think unconsciously that the fact that the Soviets were planning to put a man around the moon before the end of the year in their Zahn spacecraft had some influence. Now, if you talk to some senior NASA officials at that time, they say, no, no, that had nothing to do with it. The Russians had everything to do with it. We were coming into the last lap, and we'd be damned if we were going to lose this thing now. So the decision was made. Our very next flight, Apollo 8, would go all the way out to the moon. Apollo 8 was the boldest decision we made in the space program, period, at any time. It was the cardinal step to landing men on the moon. In seven years of space flight, no one, not us, not the Russians, had ever gone beyond Earth orbit. This was the moon we were talking about, deep space, a whole new ball game. Eight months of work done in four, but this wasn't go fever. This time we really thought we could do it. Mission commander would be Frank Borman. A lot of people got cold feet 
And I have to keep reminding people, we didn't even design this thing to go to the moon. Now we're ready to go to the moon and you're gun shy. Why? It either, it's ready or it's not ready. Borman's crew included rookie Bill Anders and Jim Lovell, Frank's old Gemini sidekick. Frank came back and told us and, and uh, so we were all elated. I thought that, yeah, this is the way to go. This is much better uh, than going around the uh, Earth for a second time with Frank Borman. I mean, you know, I didn't, didn't think that that was really necessary, but it was a much better flight to go to the moon with Frank. But still, there was something about shooting the moon that made you think twice. My wife, Susan, was convinced that we would not return from the moon. And she was, uh, in her state of mind, was uh, planning a memorial service without a body and was, was really quite convinced that she would lose her husband on the Apollo 8 flight. But I didn't realize that she had these grave reservations. Because if she would have exhibited reservations, I loved her deeply. And it would have made a big impact on, on how I approached I would, I'm, Probably, I'm not going to sit here and say I would have withdrawn, but I probably would have, uh, I would have had a lot more anguish in trying to, instead of the gung-ho attitude uh, that I had. Nine. We have ignition sequence start. The engines are on. We'd done everything we knew how to do. There was nothing left but to shoot the moon. We have TLI, Translunar Injection, a command we'd never given before. It meant we were ready to send them out of Earth orbit, off into deep space, and toward the moon. Following Houston, you're looking good here, right down the center line. Roger, following. Approaching the moon, our, uh, our blunt end was towards the moon, so we really didn't see the moon as it got bigger and, and bigger. Uh, uh, the ground call up and uh, said that uh, at such and such a time, and they gave it right down to the second, we'll lose communication because the moon's gravity will pull you around to the far side. Uh, exactly at the time that they said, right to the second, uh, we did lose communication, had static in our earphones. We looked out though, but we could not see any moon. We were upside down and backwards in perfect darkness. Apollo Control Houston, uh, switching now to the voice of Jim Lovell. Welcome to the moon, Houston. Thank you. The moon is a uh, different thing to each one of us. I know my own impression is that it's a, a vast, lonely, forbidding type existence. It's incredible. That was, to me, the one point in the mission where I thought, my God, what a team put us here. Here, we've gone 240,000 miles, and at the exact second we're supposed to see this, there it is. It was disbelief, disbelief. I think that we were like three school kids looking into a candy store window. Our noses were pressed against the window, and we looked at those ancient old craters as they slid on by, and forgot the flight plan for a while, and forgot really how dangerous this all was, because it was really something unique. They didn't know it. They hadn't seen anything yet. Well, that moment was incredible when you looked and saw the Earth flying over the lunar horizon and realized that everything that we valued was back on the Earth. And it was the only thing in the, in the whole universe that had any color. It was blue and white, and you could even see the kind of pinkish-brown continents. That was more, to me, that was a greater impact than the, than the moon. Anders was in charge of photography, and he was taking pictures of the craters on the moon. Uh, Frank and I both saw the Earth come up and thought that it was a great time to take a picture of not only the Earth, but the lunar horizon in the foreground. 
So we mentioned that, uh, but uh, Bill said, hey, we only got so many frames of film, and we got to spend them, you know, taking pictures of craters here on the moon. And then, of course, Bill looked up, and he saw what we were looking at, and he said, by gosh, we got to take a picture of that. All three of us, of course, grabbed cameras. All three of us took pictures. One of them, of course, became quite famous. It's, I think it's known as Earthrise. It was made into a stamp in 1969. Now, if you travel uh, and uh, you run into Frank Borman, be sure to ask Frank who took the picture because Frank will look at you and very seriously say, listen, I was the commander. Obviously, it's my photo. He even put it in his book that he wrote. I don't know. Andrew says he did. I said I did. I don't know. I honestly don't know who took it. You know, let me tell the truth. I really took the picture. Level's the only one we know for sure didn't. <laughs> the pictures coming back from Apollo 8 made the whole world stop for a moment. I couldn't help but think how ironic it was. At the moment of our greatest success in space, America was coming apart. We were so immersed in the mission. The terrible events of 68 didn't even leave a big impression on me. It was as if there was another world. Mike, what I uh, keep imagining is if I'm a, some lonely traveler from another planet, what I think about the Earth from this altitude, whether I think it'd be inhabited or not. It was December 1968, and Christmas couldn't come too soon. Now we were told, I guess maybe a month before the flight, that we were going to have this huge television audience from around the move on Christmas Eve and, and to do something appropriate. To me, that was an annoyance. I didn't even want to take a television camera because I thought that would detract from the flight. As we got to the moment in the flight plan after we'd been viewing the Earth and the moon, we thought, my goodness, this is so appropriate because we felt like we were looking at the beginning of a, a planet that hadn't really achieved life, and yet here in the background was the one that had. For all the people back on Earth, the crew of Apollo 8 has a message that we would like to send to you. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the Earth, and the Earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. I had an enormous feeling that there had to be a power greater than any of us, that there was a God, that there was indeed a beginning, and that maybe even our choosing to read from Genesis wasn't a haphazard thing that maybe it had been ordained some way. And from the crew of Apollo 8, we close with good night, good luck, a Merry Christmas, and God bless all of you, all of you on the good earth. We all felt how far we'd come. It had been 10 years since we'd started. Gus would have been proud. He never did make it to the moon, but without him, we wouldn't have gotten this close when we did. We'd gone around the moon. All that was left was the landing. But that wasn't going to be easy. It was eight years since Kennedy said we'd put a man on the moon by the end of the decade. With only five months to go, we were too busy getting ready for our first moonshot to worry much about the Russians. Then the CIA gave us a wake-up call we couldn't ignore. Satellite photos showed a monster rocket ready on the Soviet pad. It could only have one target, the moon. Twenty-four hours later, the rocket was gone, blown up on the pad. Russians were out of the race, but their disaster, yet another reminder. This was the world's most dangerous business.
summer 69. But this isn't Woodstock. It's the moon launch at Cocoa Beach. And the world had come to watch. I was still grounded, running the astronaut office and doing everything but fly. Launch days were the worst. I felt like a damn babysitter. On July 16, 1969, the routine was the same. Wake them up, feed them, stick them on the bus. Only this crew was going to the moon. It killed me. I could send anyone up there I wanted, except for me and my buddy Al Shepard. The program had come a long way since Al became the first American in space, but he and I still had only 15 minutes of space time between us, and they were all his. Al's dizziness and my rough running heart meant we weren't going anywhere. T-minus 15 seconds, guidance is internal. 12, 11, 10, 9, ignition sequence start. The liftoff went great, but we'd done those before. It was the landing we were worried about. That was no sure thing. But if 11 fails to land on the moon, 12 will do it, or 13, we were determined to get there before 1970. Apollo 11, this is Houston. You are confirmed to go for orbit. In mission control, I looked over at Al, and we both had the same thought. That should be me up there. Obviously, I think every one of us wanted to land on the moon. That's what we were there for. NASA could stop me from riding rockets, but they couldn't keep me from flying. Competition was always hot for space flights. But when I was selecting crews for the first moon shots, I had guys lining up to co-pilot my jet, impress me with their skills. But not that I'm suggesting for a minute they were kissing my ass. Everybody knew who you had to impress, but it was hard to figure out how. It was dog-eat-dog. -dog. There's no mystery about how I selected crews for the moon flights. I figured any one of these weenies would do a great job, so I put a list together of 18 and told them, one of you guys is going to be the first to walk on the moon. I don't know who, and I don't give a damn. They're all equally qualified. Of course, I knew one was better than the rest, but I couldn't go. Apollo 11, this is Houston. You are go for TLI, over. Roger. Ignition. We confirm ignition, and the thrust is go. Apollo 11, Roger. Yeah, Houston, uh, Apollo 11, that's that, and gave us a magnificent ride. Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, and Mike Collins. Three men headed for the history books. But they weren't picked for their personalities or because they were any better than the rest. They just happened to end up at the right slot on the flight rotation. Hello, 11. This is Looks like it's going to be impossible to get away from the fact that uh, you guys are dominating all the news back here. In Earth. Even uh, Pravda and Russia is headlining the mission and calls Neil the czar of the ship. Neil, czar of the ship. Buzz loved that. He didn't like playing second fiddle to anyone. Tension between Neil and Buzz came to a head when Buzz tried to grab the brass ring, the first step on the moon. I'm sure you don't wait until you get on the surface of the moon before you decide who steps out first. Being first on the moon obviously would be a, a landmark that everybody would remember because no one remembers the second guy. Do you remember the second guy to fly the Atlantic? So I, uh, at one time, made the observation to Neil that I felt we needed the decision on this and that one way or the other, regardless of how I felt or he felt, we needed to have a decision made on this. And, and his observation was something to the effect that he realized the historical significance and that he was not going to make a decision that would rule him out of that opportunity. Buzz Aldrin made no secret about who he thought should be the first one to take that step on the moon. We had always assumed Neil Armstrong, who was the spacecraft commander, was going to be the, the first man on the moon. We always felt like it was an unnecessary 
conflict that was created by Buzz and kind of uh, it's it created kind of a bad taste in other people's mouth about you know Buzz making this this fuss about it. Within a week or two there was a decision made that uh, Neil would be the first one and being a military man and understanding seniority that was perfectly all right with me. It came down to tradition and tradition says the commander always goes first. Besides, Neil was closest to the door. But we had much bigger problems to worry about than the first step. Like, could we even get them on the moon? There were a lot of times when I'd come home from work and think, we, we just aren't going to get to the moon. We, we cannot make the lunar module light enough. The lunar module, or LEM, we designed for the landing could only operate in the moon's gravity. So we couldn't even test fly this baby. Neil had to make do with practicing the landing in a mock-up nicknamed the Flying Bedstead. Morale hit an all-time low when the bedstead went out of control. Armstrong ejected with only one second to spare. Uh, Eleven, this is Houston. Uh, you are go for LOI, over. Roger, go for LOI. All your systems are looking good. Everything looks okay up here. Going around the corner, we'll see you on the other side, over. Roger. Now, the actual descent, I called the team together and told them that, uh, yeah, we had gone through a tough training period. We Really proud of these people here. We're about ready to sort of write into the history book that uh, no matter what happened, good or bad, that day I was going to be with them. I was very proud of them, and let's go do it. Okay, all flight controllers going around the horn. Go to go for undocking. Capcom, we're go for undocking. Roger, Eagle, undock. This was the first time we'd ever attempted a landing in the limb. At least when we were testing jets, we could eject. If this thing went down, Neil and Buzz were going down with it. We'll minor to your Delta A. Beautiful. Your Dota can take its hard descent. Okay, all flight controllers, gonna go for landing. Retro. Go. Righto. Go. Guide. Go. Control. Go. Talcom. Go. GNC. Go. Econ. Go. Surgeon. You think you're a go for landing, over. Roger, understand. Go for landing. 1201. 1201. Roger, 1201 alarm. 1201 alarm. 1201 alarm. The automatic pilot was dead. They were way off course, with a boulder feel for a landing strip. Neil was winging it, hunting around for a place to touch down. And they were low on gas. Okay, we're go. We're go, same tide, we're go. Into the egg, 47 degrees, Roger. Well, we get to one minute of fuel remaining, and you'll hear on the voice uplink, you'll hear a very trite 60 seconds. 60 seconds. It was totally up to the crew from there on, and all you could do is uh, guide speed. You're sucking air, to put it bluntly. Forward. 30 seconds. Forward. By the time 30 seconds was called out, uh, I knew that we were on the final descent. It just seemed like it was a long time. And, and, if, and without saying anything, I was just body English or whatever, trying to encourage Neil, bring it down, bring it down, and let's get on the ground. Three and a half down, nine forward. Five percent. How many bites? 40 feet down, two and a half. Picking up some dust. Come on, boys, put her down. That's looking good, down a half. Four forward, drifting to the right a little. Contact light. Houston, uh, Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. We copy you down, Eagle. You got a bunch of guys about to turn blue. We're breathing again. Thanks a lot. That's the first time you had opportunity to really sit down and say, hey, Christ, we really did. This is Apollo Control Houston at uh, 105 hours. Uh, now into the flight to Apollo 11. Okay, Neil, we can see you coming down the ladder now. Okay, Neil, we can see you coming. I'm going to step off the limb now. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Roger, the EVA is 
Probably the crucial decision was made in May of 1961 when President Kennedy said we're going to go to the moon in this decade. If he hadn't done that, we might still be horsing around trying to get to the moon. I always thought I should have had something profound to say that night to the troops, but the truth is I walked out, looked up at the moon, and thought, those are two lucky sons of bitches up there. I'll never forget that picture. <laughs> the guys in that little damn quarantine doghouse and Nixon looking through the window like he might catch moon germs. Well, we'd won the race to the moon, and Neil Armstrong was the most famous man on Earth. But we weren't going to stop there. We had all these great plans for space stations, big moon bases, even trips to Mars. The one thing we hadn't figured on was the public losing interest. Well, it makes you wonder whether or not uh, we get our priorities in order, actually. It's not worth it. No way in the world. Why should they go up there when they have so many ghettos that should be cured? People are going hungry all over the United States, and uh, they need jobs and everything else. Apollo 12. The second landing. Already it was old hat, and the program was under question. That meant only one thing to astronauts. I might not get my ride. One guy was determined he would get his ride. Nothing was going to stop Al Shepard. Not even the fact that he'd been grounded for six years. I had tried everything that I knew of to figure out a way to cure the Meniere's syndrome. Just absolutely, almost at my wit's end, when one day Stafford came in and said, you know, Al, I've just been talking to a friend of mine who's involved in the ear business. He's with a clinic in Los Angeles. They've been experimenting with a surgical cure for many years. And I said, Tom, I am on my way. Al didn't tell me he was having the operation. First I knew of it, he was knocking at my door saying he was good to go. My first move, of course, was to head for a visit with my old friend Slayton. And obviously both of us knew that uh, the next available mission, which had not been announced, was Apollo 13. So I said, Deke, that's the one I want. And Deke said, I think we can work it out. As I recall, the uh, crew tentatively had been assigned for Apollo 13. I frankly don't remember who they were, but I'm sure they were qualified guys. <laughs> and disappointed. <laughs> and disappointed. How in the hell did he pull that one off? But to get a flight like that, unreal. And here's Deke, who just had a minor fibrillation, no major problem, and here's Shepard on a command of a, of a lunar mission. Well, he pulled it off. He hadn't pulled it off quite yet. For the first time ever, the NASA brass rejected my crew selection. Deke came to me and said, uh, you know, Al's been grounded for some time, and uh, we want to make sure that he gets plenty of training before he goes on this flight. And, so why don't you take 13 and we'll give Al 14. And we were all happy until two days out. <laughs> we might uh, give you a quick, uh, a quick shot of our entertainment on board spacecraft. The whole world had watched the first lunar landing. Now we couldn't even get the networks to air this live TV show from Apollo 13. They ran soap operas instead. Okay, Jim, uh, it's been a real good TV show. Uh, we think we ought to conclude it from here now. Uh, what do you think? Roger, sounds good. And this is the crew of Apollo 13. Wish everybody there a nice evening. Hey, Houston, uh, we've had a problem here. Say again, please. Oh, uh, Houston, we've had a problem. Main B, bus undervolt. Roger, main B, undervolt. Stand by. First an explosion. Now they're losing all their power. Flight, I've got a feeling we've lost two fuel cells. I hate to put it that way, but uh, I don't know why we've lost them, and it's not an instrumentation problem. O2 tank one is steadily decreasing. We had a pretty large bang associated with the um, caution and warning. Um, it doesn't look good. Of course, we didn't know what caused it. We didn't know whether it was a meteorite that hit someplace. 
and I looked up at Fred Hayes, who was in the lunar module at the time. I could tell from his expression he didn't know what caused it. Yeah, and I look at me looking out the uh, hatch, and we are bending something. We are, uh, we are bending something out uh, into the uh, into space. I looked out the left-hand window, and it dawned on me that this was uh, this was oxygen. Didn't take much intelligence on my part to realize that. And that's when the old lead weight went down to the bottom of my stomach. It couldn't have happened at the worst time. 200,000 miles from Earth, and now we have an explosion and we're losing all of our oxygen. We couldn't figure out what the hell had happened. We'd already proven we could handle emergencies, a failure here, a breakdown there, but this was different. Everything was failing at once. We called in every man we had. When Kraft came in, I said, Chris, I think we're in a, a bunch of shit. Here is a bulletin from ABC News. The Apollo 13 spacecraft has had a serious power supply malfunction. At the moment, the astronauts are continuing to try to isolate their trouble. A late report says the spacecraft now is operating on battery power alone. All unnecessary equipment is being turned off. I want you to get some guys figuring out minimum power in the LEM to sustain life. We figure we've got about 15 minutes worth of power left in the command module, so uh, we want you to start uh, getting over in the LEM and getting some power on that. The spacecraft would be dead in 15 minutes. The crew needed a lifeboat, and the only thing that came close was the lunar module. And about the time they finally called up and said, we think you got a real problem that you might have to use the lunar module as a lifeboat. Well, Fred and I were already climbing through the tunnel and going back into the lunar module. I'd say this is as serious a situation as we have ever had in manned space flight. If at any time in the mission, however, the LEM had separated and we had gotten ourselves into a rendezvous situation or uh, the, the command module being around the moon, then what you state is absolutely true. It would, it would be a fatal situation. And that was probably the toughest, pre undoubtedly the toughest press conference I've ever been to, where I knew the, the wives and the kids of the guys who were up there and who were, who were close friends of mine, and I wasn't really convinced we were going to get them back. It really didn't look very good at the moment. Now the media was covering the story. The third moon mission might not preempt regular TV, but a disaster in space would. The spacecraft didn't have the power to turn around. We'd have to use lunar gravity to whip them back to Earth. If they might have had the back of the mind, it'd be much better for that crew to come back and hit the Earth in some manner. Not so much that it was survivable, but rather than have us as a monument to the space program that would whip around the Earth for infinity. We were racing against time. The lunar module was keeping the guys alive, but it was never designed for a long trip. Fred Hayes determined how much oxygen we had in the lunar module, how long the batteries would last, how much water we had in the lunar module, not just to drink, but also we had to use it to cool all of our electronic systems, otherwise they would fail. When Deke asked me first, will we have enough power? And I told him very honestly, Deke, I don't think so. And it turned out that we would run out of electrical power and water long before we could get home. We had to get them home sooner. That meant speeding up the spacecraft. But they only had enough power for one attempt at this critical burn. And just as we were approaching the moon, the ground had called up and said, yeah, we think these procedures will work. Are you ready to copy? And I said, yes. And I looked over at my companions. And I said, gentlemen, what are your plans here? And they said, Jim, as we go around the far side of the moon, we're going to take some pictures. And I said, if we don't get home, you won't get them developed. OK, look, let's get the camera squared away and get all set for the burn. We've got one chance, pals. Jim, you are go for the burn. Go for the burn. Roger, on the go for the burn. Guys. Control, okay. Let's go. Let's go, Captain. Pinko, do you have the Omni for the burn attitude? Four burn, 40%. West Houston, you're looking good. Shut down. Roger, shut down. I say that was a good burn. At this point, I wanted to get the crew some rest. They'd been awake for days. I feel you're throwing a hell of a long time without any sleep. I'm afraid I'm just thinking about getting people back to sleep again because... Uh, I didn't get any sleep last night at all. 
you couldn't sleep. I mean, it was just a cold, clammy. Everything was getting wet. All the windows were perspiring. The, the metal was very cold to the touch. It seemed to sap out any heat out of your body when you touched it. I developed a prostate urinary infection and uh, had uh, the most severe chills and fever that I'd ever had uh, and at times would, uh, couldn't stop shaking and we were trapped in this vehicle. It was amazing the amount of isolation we had in the spacecraft and not realizing the impact of our crises it had back on Earth. You know, we knew we were in trouble. We talked to Houston, and but they never relayed back, you know, that the whole world was glued to their TV sets. It was time for re-entry. The crew was down to their last few ounces of water. It had been the longest six days of our lives. Now they had to leave the lifeboat and land the crippled spacecraft. We'd overcome obstacle after obstacle, but it wasn't over yet. We jettisoned the service module, and then we saw it. The huge hole left by the explosion. And there's one whole spot of that spacecraft missing. The whole panel is blown out. A lot of debris is just hanging out to the side. An explosion that could tear a hole that big could have damaged the heat shield. Without that shield, they'd burn alive. No one said anything to the crew. Nobody had to. That's good. Okay, copy that. Farewell, Aquarius. Thank you. The lifeboat was gone. The crew was back in the crippled command module with a dicey heat shield and only enough battery power for re-entry. All we could do was cross our fingers. Hang in there, it won't be long. Okay, LOS in uh, a minute or a minute and a half. Uh, an entry attitude we'd like on me, Charlie. And if there's a time when you died a thousand deaths, it was wading through that period of time when it was just up to the crew and, and the good work that you'd done before. And there was no more help you could, uh, nothing you could do. I mean, you were helpless. Odyssey Houston, standing by, over. And then finally there's a vast relief where you just finally see the spacecraft on TV, you see the shoots blossom out. This one here, it was really a combination of absolute exhilaration and total exhaustion. But it was just to the point, and then you know, I, I just cried when it was all over. My interest in aviation goes all the way back to Lindbergh. I was a young boy when he flew. Of course, he immediately became a national hero. He became uh, uh, certainly a hero of mine. Al Shepard was selected to carry the national image on our first flight in space after we had been shot down by a Gagarin. Then it was fitting that after Apollo 13, Al Shepard is the commander of the mission that is going to restore the confidence in the space program. The retread and the two rookies. That's what Al, Stu Rusa, and Ed Mitchell were known as. There was a whole lot of bitching in the ranks that Al picked two guys with no flight experience to go to the moon. Everybody thought we were the three rookies. And in all of my private conversations with Stu and Ed, it was, fellas, we're going to land closer, we're going to bring back the best rocks, we're going to fly the best goddamn lunar mission that's ever been flown. No one ever fought harder to get a flight assignment than Al Shepard. And no one ever worked harder to get ready than this old Project Mercury veteran and his two rookies. He and I walked out and looked at his Saturn V, 38 stories high, all lit by spotlights. And I've often related that moment to a time 
10 years previous, when I was a young lieutenant, getting up at 1 and 2 o'clock in the morning to watch this guy named Alan Shepard jump on top of a rocket and blast off into space. And here I was 10 years later standing next to that same man. He was going to go to the moon the next morning. You know, how many people can say that? After years of frustration from watching others take their trip into space, Shepard was finally getting his chance. America's first man in space was going to the moon. 20 seconds, the guidance system now going internal. 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8. Ignition sequence start. We have liftoff. Uh, the tower is clear. Three minutes past the hour. Shepard reports roll program completed. Pitch profile still in progress. Okay, we're one Bravo. Status check and mission control. Coming up all reads on the flight director's console. In Houston, everything looks good here on the ground. Al had his ride, but after Apollo 13, we weren't taking anything for granted. And sure enough, we had problems from the get-go. The first major function on the flight, of course, was to dock with the lunar module and be on our way. Houston, we're about to dock. He hit that thing dead center, bounced right back out with no capture. OK, Houston, uh, we did it twice. If they couldn't dock, and be coming right back home. The space program didn't need another failure. I thought that maybe I didn't hit it hard enough. Sure looks like we're closing fast enough. I'm going to back back out here and try it again. You do have a go for another try. Try it again. I hit it fairly hard on that next try. Ed made the comment, said, hey, let's don't run through it. Well, we better back off here and uh, think about this one, Houston. That, of course, initially says, you, hey, you can't go to the moon. Al had waited too long to let a broken latch stand in his way. We were so target-oriented that we began thinking about all possible ways to correct the docking problem. And one obvious way which occurred to me immediately was the fact that we could do it manually. Al proposed to Houston that we put on our our suits and depressurize the command module and he would go outside and pull the two together. This would have been something totally unpracticed, pretty much on the uh, on the cutting edge of, uh, of a risky operation to say the least. Of course the immediate reaction on the ground was well that guy, Shepard, uh, really wants to get there, doesn't he? Uh, we suggest you come in hard and fast and retract the arrow. Roger, Ed. We got a very good picture. We got some of them. I got a hard dock. Is it the hard dock? Roger, Al. That's great. Super job. Wheels down and Al would be there. All he had to do was land. But this would be the toughest landing yet, even for a carrier pilot. The site was a mountainous region with peaks 10,000 feet high. Just as Al started down, he lost the thing he needed most. The landing radar was dead. And we kept getting lower and lower and closer to 13,000 feet and still no landing radar. There was no way we were going to let Al go down without radar. And if he didn't get it working by 13,000 feet, mission rules said he had to abort. After all this effort, all this time, we're almost there, and we've got a serious problem here. As Al got closer to 13,000 feet, I started getting nervous. My old buddy just might disobey that order. Apollo 14, Apollo 14, this is Houston. 
The ground rules are sometimes made upon arbitrary decisions. Maybe one could have gone to a lower altitude uh, before deciding to abort. Uh, maybe one could have gone down to the point actually where we could, one could pitch over and actually view the lunar surface. And of course, if one does that, then hypothetically, one is able to make a safe landing. He was not going to abort. He's going to land. Finally, some bright young man in the control center realized, from looking at his indications, that the radar was in fact on, but it was locked up on infinity. So he said, well, let's turn it off and let it recycle, and I think it might work. And Terry's uh, Houston would like you to cycle the landing radar breaker. Cycle. Okay, I would like to accept the radar. Board radar. Whoa, great. <laughs> and then Terry's Houston, you go for Brahma. The 90 feet. One feet per second, five feet per second now. Okay, now, looking great. 60 seconds. Okay, 50 feet down. And Mitchell turned to me and said, Al, what were you going to do if the landing radar wasn't working by 13,000 feet? I looked at him and I said, Ed, You'll never know. Okay, Al, beautiful. We can see you coming down the ladder right now. It looks like you're about on the bottom step and on the surface. That's bad for it, old man. Okay, you're right. And it's been a long way, but we're here. So one of us had made it at least. And while I couldn't be in Al's shoes as he stood there on the moon, I understood better than anyone what it meant for him to be there. It had been a long build-up to finally reached the point where I was able to stand on the surface of the moon. It was an emotional moment for me. It was a sense of personal triumph, personal satisfaction. In a few moments of maybe patting myself on the back before it became obvious that uh, we had to get back on schedule and get on with the job. Take a look at Fromm I take a look at Concrete, I should say. And it's a very impressive sight. Okay. I don't know if Al came back with the best rocks, but he certainly came back with plenty of them. The mission had been a success, but Al wasn't quite done. There was one parting moonshot he wanted to make. Okay, Houston, to my left hand, I have a little white pellet that's for millions and millions of Americans. Uh, drop it down. I'm going to try a little sand trap shot here. That looked like a slice to me, Al. Miles and miles and miles. Maybe Al Shepard will tell us for the first time what, what the brand of that golf ball was he hit on the moon. <laughs> nice try, nice try, John. <laughs> but I think the real, the real thing is the, the truth of how far it went. We yeah. get all different stories. Yeah. Crew of injuries is leaving Farmer Base. Roger, Al. Yeah. You and Ed did a great job. And uh, with this closeout, Al Shepard. Not age uh, two score and seven years becomes the undisputed leader in time spent walking, uh, working on the moon. Three, two, one. What a liftoff. And liftoff. Roger, ignition. When we left the moon, and that's such a beautiful sight where you're coming up off the moon and you're going so fast. I mean, it is so beautiful. And I said, Al, have you got something prophetic to say and he looked over at me and he said Stu you know me better than that and that's typical Al. <laughs> One of the moments which I shall never forget occurred three weeks after the return from the moon when my father and I were just having a little brandy in the living room and out of the blue he said do you remember when you first called us back in 1959 and said you were going to become an astronaut? I said, yes, sir. And he said, do you remember what I said? I said, yes, sir, I certainly do. You were not in favor of it. And he raised his glass and said, I was wrong. That's all he had to say.
Apollo 17, the final moon shot. Not even Al Shepard could turn the tide of public opinion. His mission had been a success, but America had turned its back on the moon. Apollo missions 18, 19, and 20 were canceled. 17, Houston, you are go for orbit, go for orbit. We knew that Apollo 17 was the end of Apollo. The press would never forget it. They kept saying, how does it feel to, to, to be the tail of the dog, or how does it feel to be part of the end? And, you know, guys were losing their jobs as a result uh, of, of Apollo. As soon as we lifted off, all the Grumman crew got their pink slips. There was a feeling of profound disappointment that the program was ending. Of course, I was disappointed that I didn't get the chance to go to the moon, but more than that, we put together this tremendous team and technology. To stop it now just didn't make any sense. Historians will look back on this program and wonder why the United States, at the height of its technological achievement, uh, just quit. Sure, I knew that I would be the last man of Apollo to walk on the moon. And it might be as long as 10 or 15 or 20 years. But truly, when I left the surface, I believe then, and I believe now, someone will be back someday. May the spirit of peace in which we came be reflected in the lives of all mankind. Those were the last official words spoken on the moon. Now, the unofficial words are about 10 seconds before Jack Schmidt and I lifted off, and I just looked over at Jack and I said, Jack, let's get this mother out of here. Proceeded, three, two, one, ignition. Right away, Houston. That's your good. I remember when I called George Lowe and told him I was leaving the, the program, he wrote me a very nice letter, and in that letter he said, there'll never be another Apollo in anybody's life. And I thought, maybe that says it all. But the story's not over yet. There's one chapter left to be told, and it's mine. I always knew they were wrong about my heart, that one day I'd be able to say, Deke Slayton, astronaut. I knew I could have flown any one of those missions, but the docs got fixated on the fact that once in a while my heart skipped a beat. Then as suddenly as it started, the problem stopped. I had a bad cold and started taking vitamins by the handful. Then it hit me. My heart hadn't missed a beat in months. Of course, it wasn't easy convincing the NASA docs that vitamins could cure a heart fibrillation. We knew more about Deke Slayton's heart than any person we ever flew. And that goddamn doctor stood up in the meeting and said, well, we know we've said that before, but if he fibrillates on the pad, we want to stop the count and I fired that son of a bitch. When Deke was able to finally get approval to fly again, I was just so, so delighted for him, uh, so happy. Uh, and uh, I thought, well, this guy really wants to fly. He's even going to learn how to speak Russian so he can fly in space. Uh, Boris, uh, the Volgograd. All of us wanted to be first at something. Maybe there was some poetic justice there in Deke's case that he got to make the first joint mission with the Soviets. Talk about a Hollywood ending. My ride came right out of a movie, Marooned. It portrayed the Russians as the good guys, saving two American astronauts stranded in space. This movie helped convince both countries that a joint mission was possible, even during the Cold War. I want to be a movie star. Alexei Leonov, cosmonaut, and my buddy. He was one of the guys we'd been competing against in the race to the moon. Now we were on the same team, training together, 
doing our bit to thaw out the Cold War. Here I am at another pre-launch breakfast. Only this time, I'm not sitting on the sidelines. Finally, it's my turn. Good morning again. Jim Hartz and Alan Shepard from the Mission Control Center in Houston, Texas. At that time, we were very close, having worked together in an administrative capacity over the years when neither one of us could fly. And to finally see my buddy get a chance to give it a go really meant a great deal to me. Five, four, three, three two, two, engine sequence start. Zero. One, zero, launch commit. We have a liftoff. All engines building up thrust. Moving out. Clear the tower. The launch. I loved it. Damn, I'd like to do one of those every day. Didn't get a whole lot of time to cogitate, but I couldn't help feeling a little sad that this was the last time an Apollo spacecraft would soar into space. And of course, I thought about Gus. Apollo Houston, I got two messages for you. Moscow is go for docking. Houston is go for docking. It's up to you guys. Have fun. All righty, sounds good. Palomino, Mila, Alexi. Three meters. One meter. Contact. Capture. If you'd have told me way back when that one day we'd be shaking hands with the Russians in space, I think I'd have told you to go see one of my doctor friends at NASA. The irony is, we needed the Russians all along. If we hadn't had them sitting out there, we might never have even tried to shoot the moon. It's like all American endeavors. We've got to have a competitor. All philosophers say the best part of a good dinner is not what you eat, but with whom you eat. Let me call to express my very great admiration for your hard work, your total dedication in preparing for this first joint flight. Zeke, um, you've had a very, very long record of distinguished service preparing other astronaut crews for various space missions. And we're extremely pleased to see you on the crew of the first international manned space flight. As the world's oldest space rookie, do you have any advice for young people who hope to fly on future space missions? Well, uh, <laughs> yes, I have a lot of advice for uh, young people, but I guess uh, probably one of the most important bits is to number one, decide what you really want to do, and then secondly, never give up until you've done it. In the beginning, we didn't share a dream. We shared a drive to be the best. Farther, faster, higher. The creed we lived and died by. But who could have known it would take us so far? I feel so fortunate that uh, I happen to be around at a time after hundreds of thousands of years when people whether they moved out of a cave or not, and looked up and looked at the stars and things and wondered, what's up there? And uh, we haven't gone very far yet. We're a tiny little distance uh, off the Earth. But how lucky we are to have been around and uh, to have been able to, to uh, take part in some of those first little steps. We were test pilots at the right time, right place. We were rivals, friends, fellow travelers, some of the luckiest men who ever lived. Deke Slayton, astronaut, died of cancer in 1993 during the making of this series. His heart was strong until the end.
Six hours after his death, Deke's racing plane was spotted taking off from a California airport. Not only had Deke died hours before, but that same plane, that same time, was in a Nevada museum. As Deke always said, no matter what happens, keep the dream alive. Godspeed and good tailwinds, buddy.